Hey folks, today we have David DeHilster from Dissident Science. And the John Chappell Natural Philosophy Society. And we are talking about the whole workings of everything in the universe. Uh, but all of your favorite topics, we're getting into uh, expansion tectonics versus plate tectonics, the inner workings and the physicalization of the atom. Why Einstein was wrong. The sage theory of gravity, push versus pull. I mean, we're getting into pretty much all of our favorite topics today. This was an outstanding conversation. And David's just a really curious and interested dude who's been around the block in the science world for a long time. I think you guys are going to love it. If you like what we do, leave a comment, tell your friends. If you have already done those things and you're casting about, not sure what you can do to further support the project, go ahead and go over to our Patreon. We're at patreon.com slash demystifysci, and you get early access to episodes. You get to join us once a week and pose all of your most pressing scientific questions. You get to suggest guests. And really, you just get to participate in what we're building here. We are at basically, what, like year one and a half of something that is going to be decades long. And so by getting in on the ground floor, you are steering the ship in a way that people in the future will not be able to do. Yeah, and we're like building up the project, you know, we're going to hopefully take this on the road soon. We want to definitely be moving these towards live interviews. And obviously, that's going to take a budget. So, you know, we're just working our jobs here. But if we want to build this into something bigger, like we're going to need your help. And so far, you guys who are supporting us have done wonders. And we're moving in that direction for Rita sure. Rita Pfeiffer bought us a dishwasher. That was nice. <laughs> that did happen. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, anyways, a lot of cool stuff happening. Um, look forward to all of the new features that are going to be showing up. And this is a great conversation. Enjoy it. The scientific revolution starts now. Kuhn talks about scientific revolution, and he kind of looks at it more like sort of a little cycle kind of thing. You know, I've read his book, obviously. Whereas... Um, Glenn Borchardt puts down what the universal, what he calls the 10, 10 assumptions of science should be. And with that, you can really put that against every, you know, everybody's ideas. And you have to, you know, follow these if if you really believe you're trying to do scientific work. So it's a philosophy. Are they like um, different values or something? Or does it do uh no, they're just they're just logical constructs like consupanability is a one that says all what is that sorry, you know, sorry, what is the word? Consupanability. Consupanable. Consupanable means that a theory has to be self-consistent. Like special relativity is not consupanable. You have two two um, assumptions that just don't go together. You know, the speed of light has to be constant and, and all physics has to be the same for all moving frames. And of course, it, it isn't according to Einstein's own theory. So, um, you know, there's a lot of, lot of those kinds of things. Um, you know, I, I don't have them on the top of my head, but they are definitely his infinite universe too. He was the one who really defined that the universe goes infinitely down and infinitely up in the size of structures, kind mm. of like a fractal. And mm. uh, many of us who are outside the mainstream, who have discussed these kinds of things for the last couple of decades, we're pretty convinced that you you know you can't have the smallest particle because it can't organize itself by magic to make mm. the whole universe. So uh, he's also has that the infinite universe theory. So his work is just a foundation for most all of us outside of mainstream physics uh and he's he's a he it's funny because he's a geologist by trade hmm. but uh his his work is it, without his his work we would my father and i could not have written what we did hmm. and a lot of other people as well so does he have pretty mainstream geology ideas or was he oh he pushing? does that's that's the really funny part <laughs> of it is that he and i argue the problem is he makes a not a lot of money. He's not a millionaire, but he makes a lot of money per hour in California telling people about subduction faults underneath their properties. They pay him a bunch per hour for that. And so even though he says that there's a ton, he said it, there's a ton of evidence for the expanding earth. 
um, I don't subscribe to it because he can't because he'll have to get himself out of a job. And, and even though he's very retired and he's coming to the end of his, his life and his career, um, you know, I think deep down inside, he knows that, but it's kind of funny. Uh, I, I kind of joke, I stay away with it because I said, it doesn't matter what you think about that, that expanding earth is absolutely true. I mean, the, the evidence overwhelming, like he's even said, but your work is going to stand. So don't worry. You're our, and it's so fascinating how these contradictions can exist within us. Like we yes. can, we can be stuck in one, like literally fighting the same demon over here and yeah. like working for the demon over here. It's a, it's a really interesting thing that plays out over who's, and over. Who's the demon in your life? I don't know. Like if you don't, you know, that, that science is stuck in the mud or something like that, you know, and you're right. trying to slay that on one side. Yeah. I guess it's interesting because you say that expanding your earth is incontrovertibly true. And my mindset is I'm like. How did you say that? I think so, didn't you? Oh yeah, absolutely. The you know the thing is is the evidence is so great, is so overwhelming. I mean, there's sometimes you have a, if I were to look at all the dissident kind of all the outside of mainstream disciplines that I would bet my everything on and that would be the expanding earth. The evidence is just too overwhelming. The the book um um beyond uh uh, let's see here it is this is the the most important geology book ever written in my opinion it's called beyond plate tectonics and that's by it's actually you can get it online he has made it totally in a pdf form on uh, available the evidence is just is is, is super overwhelming it's, who's, it, the, you, who's you, the author of that i didn't catch i didn't uh, see it dr james maxlow, maxlow. In, in, yeah. In fact, um, he was given this whole task and he didn't want to in 1994 by one of the most famous geologists of his time, uh, Samuel Warren Carey. He was from Tasmania or from Australia. I can't remember. I think maybe Tasmania mm -hmm. over in the, you know, in that area of the world. And he was one of the, he is by geologists, one of the great geologists, but he was kind of looked as fringe because his Everything he saw pointed to an expanding earth. He then had to pass it to somebody and he passed it to this young guy at the time, James Maxlow. And Max Maxlow got this telegram, I think, from him. And he, of course, you're getting a telegram from, you know, one of the most famous geologists that ever ever lived, saying, I want you to continue this mantle. And he he really kind of took it over reluctantly. He didn't want to do it. But you don't say no to a, 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 a an icon in geology. So he started looking at it and you know he said that what what kind of the thing that tipped him from just being a regular geologist in plate tectonics to expansion tectonics was when he plotted the the South Pole. If you look at the South Pole, it's very, very precise as where the South Pole has been. It started in Africa and moved down to where it is now. And what he found out is, is there was just no explanation that anyone had for that, except when he put the expanding Earth. It turns out at that time, Africa was tucked under, the continent was what tucked under, and that that was at the bottom of the Earth at the time. And it slowly, when it expanded, it'll do this. It kind of, the Earth's expanded more like this. It didn't expand uniformly, right? That's why we have a Pacific bigger than the, et cetera. But he said the moment that he plotted the real data from mainstream science of where the Antarctica was and put it on the expanding Earth, he said at that point he could not unsee that. It was just too old. And then after that, he put together in this book just uh, the almost overwhelming evidence that you can really come across. And, um, you know, it's truly fascinating because it changes everything, even physics. And so I've I've become friends with him and um, it has nothing to do with him. We've argued about different things are, even amongst our, uh, ourselves. So, Man, I, li I, liked how you, I liked how you put it, uh, expansion tectonics as opposed to expanding Earth. I mean, I think that's kind of at the heart of, of what needs to happen for a theory to be entertained in the mainstream. Is it, ha it has to have that integrative aspect, really, right? Oh, yeah. Because there's so, so many things about extant plate tectonics that overlap with expansion tectonics that I oh, see yeah. just from the outside, right? I, I've never worked on either one of them in particular, but they, they both talk about like the continents essentially having moved apart, right? They agree on so much, right? It's oh, really yeah. just this tiny little question. Well, if you, it's, and it's also, hold on, if I can add, sure. like there's, there's pretty good evidence for the fact that the continents are still moving relative to one another. Like this isn't right, a particularly right. mysterious 
thing. Well, like it, turns, it, turns, it turns out if you study the history of it, which is really fascinating, expansion tectonics was ahead of uh, before plate tectonics. What happened in the history of, of plate tectonics and expansion tectonics, by the way, James Maxlow did, it's interesting you talked about the word, he was the one who came up and coined expansion tectonics mm -hmm. because he's a, he's a geologist. Well, it turns out in 1960, two things were, were coming to the forefront of geology. And the old geologists from the beginning of the 20th century had to face two very overwhelmingly different ideas that they just were hard to believe. It was hard for them to swallow. One was the plate tectonics that plates actually moved. They, 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 couldn't, they couldn't fathom that. The second one, the, 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 at the same time, expansion tectonics. In fact, you can find, I don't know if it was Time Magazine, but some big, big magazine had an expansion tectonics article in the 1950s. Is that right? The, yeah. The it, was, 19, it, was the new, it was New Scientist. Yeah. And, but, but in the 1950s, and so what happened in 1960, I talked with James Maxwell, I said, what went on? He said, at that point, the old geologists were facing, okay, plate, plate tectonics where, you know, sort of they just swim around on a, on a fixed radius. And they go, man, I just can't see these, these you know, gigantic continents moving around. That, that was hard enough for them. But then on top of that to say, no, they didn't move around, they've expanded. And the Earth has expanded because that requires another leap, and that is mass that the Earth is gaining mass from what we now or decreased sure. or decreased density. I mean, yeah, that's it, always been. I, th I think that's why it was sort of dead in the water to the mainstream community at the time was that the mechanism w was outrageous. Well, like, yeah, but the me yeah the because you have to, you have to double the amount of uh, volume in order to increase the radius by 80 percent and right and right. and there's papers that are written from the 60s where they're like look in order to get that kind of chemical reaction expansion of the material that's already in the earth you would literally have to dissociate every single bond every single chemical right. bond on earth would have to break and then reform in order for that to happen and it's just it seems so implausible that there was a mechanism and then there was a lot of there's a lot of theories that were saying that ma material was being created in the earth and so right, it was right well there's an explanation a lot of red herrings right but let me explain how we see it mm. what happens is we know that all suns spit out parts of atoms they spit out protons neutrons and electrons we know that. In fact, when you go out in space, what kills you is not the electrons that are being shot at you. It's the protons, the nuclei. The nuclei coming in and hitting you will just do absurd damage to, to, to uh, atomic structure. And so what's happening is the sun is shooting these things out. They get caught into our magnetic field, brought into the, the center. When you have a free-range nucleus, it's going to gather, it can gather and will gather uh, electrons. We know that in the middle of suns, that there are manufacturing heavier and heavier uh, elements. We know that for a fact. So it's not creating something out of nothing. What's happening is suns are spewing out, just obliterating atoms and spewing this out, and they get recombined. That is, when nuclei enter the Earth, they get recombined, and they'll. Mm -hmm. And then what happens is you are gaining. What what is it? Uh, ninety nine point nine percent of mass of an atom is the nucleus, and when you have free nucleus is literally flying through. That's where they see it, and that, and not only that, geologists like Dr. Maxwell thinks it's happening. What they call the D layer of the uh, of the Earth. There are different layers. There's the mantle, blah blah blah, the core, and there's a D layer. That's where they think it's happening, and and that's that, it's not. But an it should expansion. be happening to all of the different planets in that case. Yes, right? yes, I and see. if you look at if you if you look up Neil uh, Neil um, Adams. We know for a fact NASA's already admitted that Ganymede is expanding. In fact, you can take if you watch Neil Adams' video on that, you can actually. I've seen that actually, the, like yes. with the stretch marks and stuff. I mean, right. it, obviously, like NASA has a slightly different take on that. Um, well, yeah, what what's happening? But it is expanding, and not only that, the the moon. I think they and, think it's and, like a tide. It's some sort of tidal right. uh, distortion of the ice shell, essentially. Um, right. But yeah, it is his that actually that video is really interesting because you can see the seams where they match up and 
And it does seem like there's a longer history there than what's apparent. You're thinking of the See the Pattern video, which is not the uh, new oh, Adams am, am video. I? Oh, I will see the Pattern did an expansion series, and it was very good. And the Ganymede videos were from the See the Pattern. I'm really videos. bad at keeping science people apart. I'm, That's I Neil, Neil no Adams, uh, he worked, I think, like in the 90s, and he made he was a like bunch. in Hollywood or something. Mm, he, was a, he was a comic book artist. A comic book artist. Yeah, yeah. Kai, yeah I, he was a friend of mine. I know he, he was. He was he was um, uh, one of the fam- most famous Batman cartoonists that ever yeah, lived. Oh, that's cool. Good. That's right. That's right. Yeah. And he he basically on his own in the early 2000s came across this idea of expanding Earth. Mm-hmm. And and the, the here, here's what when people ask me what's kind of proof about it. When you take, look at the seafloor bed, we know very, we have, there's a color striped uh, um seafloor bed map by um what is it and uh the uh national uh, they, they went no thank you very much and they every color represents 10 million years in time and it goes from 10 million years ago to 20 to 30 to 40 when you when neil adams took this and he had enough money to do it he made computer graphics in the early 2000s around 2004 to 2006 he took each of those stripes away uh, each little at a time and what happens is all the continents fit together, not just not just uh, um, of South America and Africa, but all of them, including Australia and all that. And not only that, we find that the the side of Australia, the flora and the fauna match up identically to the Northern California, which, when the Earth was smaller, is exactly what happened. Right, and of course, like NASA would agree with that, and everybody would say, "Oh, well, they just floated over." Like, of course, they used to be together. There was this like Gondwana but, land at some points, and, and but the they weren't together. According cycle. to Pangaea, they were not together. Well, there's so multiple. There. There's multiple supercontinents. Yeah, that's right, like, that's right, like that's Pangaea right. is just one of them. So you have oh, Rodinia, no, you have Gondwana, you have also the fact that it's like accreting terrains, and so it's like they're being there's, lost there's, off. But, of, but I think that like most people, like even little, like I remember being a little kid and looking at the Earth and being like, "Well, everything." fits together right it's like that's the most compelling story here yeah. to everybody is like you don't have to need a science degree of any sort no. to just look at the earth and be like uh well, that's <laughs> true. Excuse, me. excuse me have you guys thought of uh, this well so this actually touches onto a conversation that we have a lot which is about how you how you move scientific theories from the fringe to the mainstream and it seems like the mechanistic aspect of it is what attracts people to a different theory and so because expansion tectonics struggled for so long to come up with a plausible theory, because I think I've seen the papers that talk about, uh, that try to analyze it coming from the sun, and it doesn't see, because we haven't seen any super, super large coronal mass ejections, we have just, our, our average level of, material, of material that's hitting the sun is pretty low. The earth. Yeah. Oh, sorry. The material from the sun that's hitting the earth is pretty low. And so it's very easy for people to be like, well, if you average this out, there's no way that that's enough material. But, but I really do think that the, the new discoveries of these, uh, mini Neptunes that are considered that are like on, they're these gassy planets that as they lose their atmospheres become rocky earth-like planets might be the path that, uh, expansion tectonics can take into the mainstream. Because they're starting to find these really anomalous planets that have atmospheres that they are actively watching being blown away by the suns that they're nearby. Yeah, we've like we've had a couple of really cool people on the show lately. Actually, we have one one more coming up. Uh, just talking about the thick atmosphere in in the early history of the Earth, and we did like just some back of the envelope calculations on that, and it's like it really is a sufficient pressure to compress the thing down to the sizes that you'd need to squish the continents back together. And so just looking at a science that seems to actually be on the move, like planetary science is completely divorced from anything practical on Earth. Those people, like of all the different scientists that I encounter, are the ones who are most open to the idea that, oh, yeah, well, maybe maybe things change. Maybe we've formed the planets differently. Maybe the solar system forms differently. It doesn't really impact things. Whereas there's something about geology and the way it's tied into industry on Earth and the way that it's tied into the way that that, that knowledge is accumulated that seems more stuck in the mud than something that's, you know, divorced sure. from everyday life. Yeah, like now, th- there is... Go ahead. I think there there is at- Sorry, I think that there's going to be a point where we get to other planets having expansion before we get to the point where people finally are like, it probably happened on Earth as well. 
Yeah, I think it's really hard to say when these kinds kinds of things hit. I think I think you know it's what we do have to do is just keep working on it and looking at it ourselves. Now, the other thing about spanning Earth is there have been other types of ways to measure, for instance, gravity. There is a there's a very small but growing um, uh, idea and field that we should really have in science, uh, uh, which is uh, 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 paleogravity. Now, there are two ways that have been looked at paleogravity. Stephen Hurrell, uh, Hurrell a good, another friend of mine, he is a mechanical engineer from the UK. In the eight, 1980s, he was given the task of doubling the size of a mechanical part. Then he realized that that would increase the volume by eight times. When he, when he looked at that, what he decided to do was he got curious about dinosaurs and the size of those things. Square cube lot, Galileo's square cube lot, it's at the exactly. heart of everything, yeah. Exactly. So he started taking a look at that. He got very fascinated and quickly found out as a mechanical engineer that, I, uh, that um, dinosaurs could not survive today. Are you talking he about David Esker? No, this oh, okay. is uh, yeah. Stephen Hur Stephen Hurl. His right. dinosaurs and the expanding Earth is what it's called. All right, because there's um, another there's another guy who has he, almost he, the identical story. <laughs> it's amazing. He he then plotted the he then went back in in time and took the largest land animals land because of course in the water you can get really big, but in land animals and he plotted them over time, and with that plot he came up with what he calculated would be this the gravity gravitational constant at that time which was meaning gravity was lighter and so at the, during uh during the dinosaur time gravity was at least a half if not less than it is today but that could and be that could be equally accomplished with buoyancy you know that's what's incredible is like if you have a thick atmosphere you do well, lessen yeah. gravity actually i know you're talking about another thing i'm talking about looking at this kind of evidence right here so these were not i'm animals. just interpreting your evidence that's all i mean right. i think we're talking right. about the same phenomena right which is that yes obviously those animals most must have experienced less gravitational pressure because their legs would crunch otherwise and they wouldn't be able to pump blood and all these other things. The question is like, what causes that? Like, did the universe right, rearrange itself or was it just because there's some other upward force on them? What happened was the people who were geologists who were looking at the same thing, paleogravity, they also mapped it without talking about anything about the atmosphere. This right, just, but that's just in terms of pressure. So the question is like, what causes the decreased gravitational pressure? Right. So we're looking no, at like, oh, yeah, right. Right. We're ultimately, saying, we have to explain, even if you measure decreased gravity in the past, the question is what causes that, right? Well, that causes less mass. The Earth had less mass at that time. Well, so That's hold on, what, hold on. Let, let's, let's figure something out. When you say that there are studies of old signals of different gravi gravity, what are those signals? Yeah, what are we actually yeah. looking at? Like, let's, let's, let's parse that. One, one, of the, one of the ones that they've just come up with, and this is very new, are sand dune height. What happens in a gravitational field, sand dunes, because of friction, will be higher or lower depending on, on gravity. Sure. That is, the gravity will act upon each grain of sand. And so they can go back in time, millions of years, and look at what would be a, a, a functional level of what uh, a sand dune would be and then be able to do calculations as to the gravitational field at that time. Right, but do you see how like the, the gra that gravitational effect could be the result of changing in the constants, but it could also be the effect of an upward pressure like buoyancy that act opposing those gravitational What's pressures. What's a buoyancy? What are you talking about? So buoyancy is just the force of displacement by something that's more dense or, or approaching your own density, right? This is what allows us to float. So so you're saying what you're saying is another explanation for uh, the gigantism and all that would be um, and an atmosphere exactly and for and for the expansion of the crust as well because the Earth is an elastic material and when it's compressed it has a greater density and if you release that, that yeah so it's the, it, it would it results in the same appearance of decreased gravity as a result of that yeah like i'm not sure what a signal would look like that had a that could, like, clear separate difference those, yeah. between is it because of this upward displacement or is it because of less pull down towards the surface and no, I don't, I don't, I don't know. I don't know. Understood, understood. But what I was talking about is how two things came together 
Mm. in the 1980s between just doing measurements of the largest land animals compared to what geologists were calculating in their expansion. In fact, if you look in Dr. Uh, Maxwell's book, the expansion is not a linear thing. It's it's starting, the expansion, for he has it always from actually billions of years ago. And it was really, really mi minute, minuscule. And then there was, uh, you know, an acceleration, and that acceleration is literally going like that now. And so, and that kind of makes sense if you think about like the outer part of the Earth is going to be the cold part, right? It's going to be the part that's going to be brittle and subject to fracture, and it can probably there can probably be like it's probably quite discreet, like cracking an egg open, where like once you release that girdle that's on the outside of it, you you can have these discreet events that happen in steps you know oh, and yeah. and geology was historically completely allergic to stepwise things they called it catastrophism right they really hated anything that happened in discrete steps they wanted mechanisms that were consistent constant that were in play in the world around us for, as they as they appear today uh, something that you you just said which is that it became it it became exponential and is continuing to be exponential I, I, I haven't seen all of the studies that I've seen done in the last decade or so are like the earth is staying the exact same size. How do you yeah, but they, you? there's there there's there's studies about that with geo measuring with with GPS and those kinds of things. In fact, the the people who are, do study expansion tectonics are giving it about it's really small in our lifetime. Basically, the Earth will expand only in its radius, the size of the tall, as tall as we as a couple meters in our lifetime. Now, in geological times, that's huge, mm. right? But in our times, it's not. So, the, the, what we're measuring is very small. And of course, you have variations constantly. The Earth is not a perfect sphere, which will stay that distance from a, a satellite perfectly for even a decade. So, but the, the expansion that people are talking about are between, I've seen any estimates from 15 centimeters to 18 centimeters a year. Now that's really small. That's really small. So, um, and they, and, and, it's just that one of the problems is people aren't looking for it. The people with the data are not out there pursuing this because, and, and so they're going to be more likely to say, well, there's nothing I see than to try to understand the complexity, just like the tides. Tides are an immensely complex problem in science. So, so yeah, the, the people, there are people who have been looking at measurements, but again, there's not enough people out there. You know, you can only do so much as one human being to do this. You know, we should have expansion tectonics should be taught in geology, not as the correct theory, but as a theory that's very viable. But of course, you can't do that. Just like you, you can't, can't really have that. pluralities of theories. Like people are really uncomfortable with it. You know, it's like it, it's sort of de in some sense, I think in an institutional sense, it, it dethrones the legitimacy of science as yeah. an end all be all. Right. It's it's yeah. really unfortunate. I agree. You know, agree. one thing I was curious if you could comment on, too, is. Like, it seems like there must have been some personality aspect to Wegener versus Carey. Like, I, I'm just always looking at, there's always these super rivalries that play out in the history of science. And I can't help but notice that sometimes a theory is integrated into the zeitgeist. It has to have some component of it where, because I, I just see the charismatic, cheerful, you know, I got the Riz. Good, good boy uh, wins so often in science. Like I was this morning, I was lecturing. Uh, I'm teaching this intro astro course, and I was lecturing on the rivalry between Jeans and Eddington. And it's like you look at it, and on the face, you're like, okay, both these guys have great ideas here and there. But Eddington was just so. He was beloved. He was beloved, he was right? He, he was, was like clever. Neil deGrasse Tyson. Exactly. He was writing in the New York Times. He was embraced by the right people, I think, that he never right. really well. I wonder how much of that was going on with the expansion stuff, yeah. too. I, well, so, hold on. I just want to say, like, I, I, as, as, as I remembered, there was a study that was published just a few years ago where they measured the expansion of the Earth, and they were like, it is at most 0.1 millimeters a year. How'd they measure it? Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. It's a, there's two things. GPS. Who's measuring it? Who is measuring it and how China, they're measuring it? Was a, it was a team from China using VLBI and GPS. And so, like, right. these are pretty standard. My, Maybe their GPS is getting dilated or something. I mean, you there there are there are many, many papers. and Because we, we did an investigation into expansion. And this was mm -hmm. something that I was trying to figure out because exactly the thing that Shiloh's talking about. Because I'm like, look, 
This is a theory that seems like it has fertile ground for being accepted because mm -hmm. there's many things that are starting to point to it. I mean, we had a freaking NASA astronaut on this show who was like, yeah, the atmosphere used to be thicker, like for sure. Yeah. I mean, it's just, and the planetary science guys too, it's just wild. Like they're, you know, they're, they're I think, yeah, there's a lot of, you know, what I, I'm looking forward to more than that is when it does happen to see things settle down, because there's a lot of competing mm -hmm. ideas as to why. And I think those are going to settle down. And, and as for the study of the expan expansion, uh, believe me, there's a many, many hundreds of people in our organization that are expansionists, right? And trying to get data with that's hard because also GPS is another whole problem in itself um, that has to do with what are you really measuring? What's really going on is, you know, what's happening with, if there's any relativistic effects at all. Um, most of, uh, uh, one of my very good friends who just passed away was Ron Hatch, who had over 30 patents in GPS, who was one of the, the people who stood up and says, GPS does not support special relativity. In fact, it contradicts it. And he was, he, he was under the, uh, you know, idea that the speed of light is not constant. That you can actually, one of the problems NASA was having with GPS was trying to, there's a discrepancy of, of 0.5 picoseconds, which he claimed was because when you, how they pretend special relativity is being violated is, is when you send one signal from one one satellite to another, it's, it would be the speed of the satellite plus C, which you can't do in special relativity. And then, but when it comes back, it's minus C. So they say it doesn't violate special relativity because of the round trip part of it. But yeah. when you're actually trying Hold to- Hold on a second. Hold on a second. I want to I wanna make sure that I understand this. So what you're saying is that when they're calculating the times of the signals being sent in between satellites, in order to get the right amount of time, it's not- the speed of light alone it's the speed of light plus the speed of the satellite and in the reverse direction it's minus the speed of the satellite yeah that's crazy i mean the stellar but, stellar aberration is calculated in a similar fashion it's strange they do velocity addition to the speed of light also it's it's very very bizarre okay hold on hold on hold on, hold on. this is a this is like a foundational precept that c is of the course. limit so what's of course. how is this everybody's just like okay with this i mean oh, yeah, yeah absolutely it's okay and and the reason it <laughs> and let me t let me tell you why and you're talking yeah, yeah. about you're asking me the question about how do personalities come in well the whole problem with einstein is einstein when he was dead has been making 10 to 12 million dollars a year for the university he willed his information his 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 um image and his works to and they still, to this day, make a lot of money after him, even though in 2010, they were taken to court by, G they, they took GM to court because GM used the picture of Einstein's head on this muscle bound body with E equals MC squared here. <laughs> and then they, they said that was a violation and they had to pay, pay royalties for that. Turns out the statute of limitations finally ran out, but they, they keep his legacy alive, even though everyone underneath kind of knows it doesn't work and it's wrong the 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 israeli um university has been fighting tooth and nail to keep him above ground and constantly putting another another um uh, experiment shows him right another experiment shows him right another and and they migrated from um the actual getting uh, giving example the movie ai by um Steven Spielberg, who was Jewish, and Einstein was Jewish. He paid six hundred and twenty-five thousand dollars to use three seconds of Einstein's image in the movie to that university. And so, when you have a cash cow under your belt, which is now getting the cash, where is it going to coming from? Facebook page. There was almost twenty million people on the Facebook page for Einstein. I've been out there very politely saying you guys should look at it because you know we have a lot of evidence that special relativity is wrong they know who i am that kind of thing but that's what keeps him alive it's the it's these these people who have a invested interest in him not being wrong i mean he was famous before that stuff too i mean yeah he was the he first was, he, he was already kind of he was already tapped for the job pretty much i mean most people think he got his 
Nobel Prize for all of this uh, crazy space-time bending stuff, but he he was well on his way to a Nobel Prize for his basic molecular yeah, for, research. For, for my for my documentary, Einstein Wrong, I interviewed a friend of Einstein. It was the only person I talked to him who knew him personally. And he was, his name was Jack Rosenthal. Uh, it was 2005. He's now gone. He was 87 at the time. He, he would go every two months to Einstein's house in Princeton, and he and his wife would have dinner with him. And they'd talk about every, all kinds of things. Uh, one of the big arguments they always got in was whether or not the, the atom bomb, even though Einstein really had actually, absolutely knew nothing to do with that in reality, other than talking about it. Um, he, Einstein always had a guilt factor about that. Um, of having that bomb dropped and killing so many people. But Jack Rosenthal was literally, believe it or not, on a ship going to Japan would probably have lost his life along with millions of other people if they went invaded. But one of the things that was interesting in the story was people themselves around Einstein couldn't understand his fame. Oppenheimer, one of the greatest physicists of, of, of the 20th century, um, he couldn't understand Einstein's fame. He had to kind of uh, pay homage to Einstein, even though he didn't want to. And these are stories I know from uh, people, you know, this person who knew Einstein until he died. You got to go back. That brings us back to Eddington, too. I mean, Einstein's papers were not available to an English-speaking audience at first, right? And, and Eddington really decided he was going to make Einstein a star for oh, whatever yeah. reason. Yeah. And yeah. I don't, I, I mean, I'd love to dig into Eddington's background a bit more and figure out more about him. Wait, so hold on one second. Were you saying that, I, that Steven Spielberg, like, cares about Einstein because they share some Eth ethnic background or something what i'm saying is he is a big donator donator because okay. of his jewish background to jewish causes which is fine this is not a or, you know or just a, a, yeah. he, he 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 he's known for his philanthropy because he has a lot of money but like it, so he, when, he only donates to jewish philanthropy causes no 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 what i'm saying is because he wanted to use his his there and he was known to be a philanthropist he donated 625,000 knowing that they had to have the rights to that to that university so that was a payment for how do you say a donation payment for the rights of using his image i mean this is i mean it probably has like are you really, but it probably has nothing to do with his ethnicity i just thought uh, that's just well, kind of no, weird what i'm saying what i'm saying is though that that he made a donate he made donations i think to that university even before that but yeah but I'm he's saying, a supporter of the sciences you know yeah yeah so, so regardless of that, what I'm saying is he, there was a payment made for the use of his image in his film. Fair enough. Yeah. Gosh, that's so interesting that somebody can get copyrighted like that by their, yeah, seriously, by like their, dead body, their, their dead institution memory. or something, right? I mean, oh, it, you, I, look it up. Look it up. 2017, Einstein was the second most, second highest grossing dead celebrity at two, $10 million so a year. A year. So something that's really, I mean, I, I think I pretty clearly understand Einstein's popularity and the same way that I understand Stephen Hawking's popularity and the same way that I understand like Michiko Kaku's, the God Michio particle. Kaku's popularity. Yeah, exactly. It's the God particle. It's, it's you, you tell people something that is hard for them to wrap their brains around. It's the same reason right. the black holes are popular. I mean, Einstein was terrible. Like, he was so charismatic and he was a poet and a dreamer. And a musician. And, and you know, he had some sort of priestliness to him too. Yeah. He was very esoterically interested. And like, in I, I think that I notice on the fringe sometimes where people have good ideas, but I think that they really value being super disagreeable. And oh yeah, I agree. The, the I disagree. agree. And I'm like, you're you're shooting yourself in the foot. Like people yeah. want a hero. They want someone who is the knight in shining armor. They want someone who is the princess in the castle. Like they don't align with the like the warty hag or the the troll under the bridge. Like these yeah. are things that people just don't identify with. And so often you come across people that have great ideas, but have spent a career basically alienating themselves and oh, ostracizing yeah. themselves from anybody who has any kind of clout from listening to them. And, Absolutely, I and agree. Like what do you what do you make of that? Because well, is it just is it just like a lack of of insight? Personality is, trait no, clusters? Yeah. <laughs> no, no, no. There's a real explanation for it and I know it specifically from my mentor hmm. who fa who showed Einstein wrong in two ways back in the 1940s. Uh, and he was in his early 20s, PhD in physics from Argentina. And what happens over time when you know something, which he did, he found really legitimate problems with special relativity. They're, and to me, they're fatal. 
But what happens is when you find that out and you try to go against, of course, in this case, he was going against the icon of Einstein, the, you know, and people were just fell in love with him because people could understand the gravity bending light. That was the big thing that made him famous. And they, people were so the average person again. could understand. Yeah, exactly. He could, they could understand that. What happened with Dr. Karazani was after so many years of fighting with, with real truth in his hand, literal proof in his hand. And I'll give you an example of how it was proof. In 1994, it took his papers two years after I met him. I sent, I was working at TRW in Space Park in the Artificial Intelligence Group. And I said, look, I've got an experiment here that'll show Einstein wrong. And um, it'll be worth it for uh, you know us to do. That would be a revolutionary. So uh, nine physicists looked at it, including two that came out of retirement. I gave it to him. Three weeks later, I got a letter back from them saying, we can't find anything wrong with this refuta refutation. Now, the problem is, is they don't want the politics that go with it. They're not going to want to be the ones who are going to say Einstein is wrong. But with over time, after you're constantly fighting and fighting and fighting, as Dr. Kar Karazani had, and real live uh, ammunition in his hand, both mathematically and physically, real, basically proofs, which again, TRW, these physicists confirmed that these were legitimate arguments. You become jaded. You become very cynical. You become like, what am I doing? Life is a farce. Mm -hmm. When you have a great truth right in your hands and right in front of you, that's actually simple mathematics uh, algebra that you can show anybody. And they can, and, and he was not a great communicator. But the problem is, is event, you know, with time, he became extremely bitter. And these people, what do you expect? You know, you you work all your life on something that is revolutionary. He's got a better equations, simpler equations for even particle physics that he could do without the neutrino, which is an invented particle and all these other things. You know, they be he became, you know, uh, you know, when you talk with him, he was not good at selling his own stuff. I mean, he was, we went to a, we were invited to an astronomy club in 1999 at an astronomy club that actually Einstein hung out with. And he gave a talk there. And I spent most of my time trying to explain to people what he was really saying, because he only spoke of mathematics. And, and you know, if you didn't understand mathematics, you were really, it took me three years to read his mathematics to be able to tell you in words what he came, came and found. And, and yet we, he was in a place where in 1999, I was in an astronomy club, which had already explained the redshift away saying, no, the universe is expanding. It's light. This is what's happening. And so he was kind of in his element and he was talking to the layman who also abandoned most of of physics in mainstream, you know, cosmology. Hmm. And and they're they're not crazy people. These aren't, you know, dissident people who go out and say, you know, the, the earth's made of green cheese and there was no moon landings and the earth's flat. So you you see these people when they're in their element, they're great. But after a while, I can understand you have to go to your grave. And he did, knowing that probably a hundred years from now, they'll look at his work and say, this was, you know, amazing work. This is a real, we had to have somebody really refute Einstein in a mathematical and physical way. And he did, but, you know, he was, his, he couldn't explain it. And he was bitter. If you started talking about the, I mean, you should, he would lay into him like, you would not believe. What was his was his redshift idea purely mathematical, or was there? No, that was something? not that was not him. Oh, yeah, oh okay. Gotcha, astronomy gotcha. club. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, I, I do um, want to get back to the red. I want to touch on the redshift because I want to know what their explanation is. But I, I, I do. No, no, take it away. I, so, I, like, I think that there is a fundamental misunderstanding about what science is versus what people want it to be. Sometimes. Oh yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I agree with you a thousand percent on that. Where if it's you... where it's like I think that it's a pop I, I hate to say it, but I think that it's a popularity contest. It is. It is. What, what here's what people think. When you have somebody like Karazani come along and I talk to people, they say, What are you making a film on Einstein wrong? Oh, Einstein's wrong. Well, yeah, we have tens of thousands of people and papers and books published on this. Well, if it's wrong, then of course the universities would know about it and we would all know about it. I go, No, that's not the way it works. They think the way science works is that when a Karazani comes along and he's talking to his professor, and the professor should say, My gosh, a student found this amazing work. That's not what happened. They would argue about it, what, what, but what the public thinks is what happened with Karazani, it should have happened in the 1940s, is he came across two 
fundamental problems with, with the derivation for special relativity, showed it wrong, came up with the simplified uh, equations, which were Newtonian and it turned out to be not relativistic. And then the average person says, oh yeah, he took it to the university. They studied it. They realized just like the TR, TRW scientists couldn't find anything wrong with it. They realized it and Einstein was proven wrong and they went on. I think there's That's some the very, there's think. some famous like popularizer. I don't know if it's Neil deGrasse Tyson or one of these guys who's like, or like Lee Smolin or somebody who's just always coming out and being like, yeah, we've known Einstein's wrong for a long time or whatever. We've moved on. Like everybody, it seems like every single theoretical physicist has a new mathematical take on describing dynamics in the physical world, right? It's like people are just hungry for something else, I feel like. Like, like Einstein's relativity isn't that satisfying to the general public. I don't think any other mathematical representation is going to be particularly interesting to the general public. But there's something about that like the magic of it you know when you can start introducing all of these spooky crazy things into it that captures people's oh yeah like absolutely. religious it's sensibilities fantasy. it's fantasy that's what people anyway. want <laughs> they don't want to fix it right exactly no people want fantasy and that and our you know when i asked karazani why he wasn't accepted his words he he spoke he spoke Castil he spoke English but he spoke mostly Castilian Spanish which is close to Portuguese which I speak where we'd speak together but he said translate he said people want fantasy that's what sells you know talking about something real and and and, and something easy to explain they don't want but getting back to not if ninety nine point nine percent of the physicists in the world aren't theoretical and ninety nine point nine percent if you get them in a, in a drinking and, and relax at a party they're going to tell you this all this this uh, theoretical physics is nonsense i in my film uh in my film documentary einstein wrong i interview dr kelsey and he is a experimental physicist physicist before the our shoot I asked him, I always interview the person before I get him on a film. I said, hey, how's it going? So what's it like to be a theoretical physicist? He, he stopped eating, put his fork and knife down. He said, don't ever call me a theoretical physicist. <laughs> I am, there's nothing theoretical about physics. Oh, no. It's all physical. And so when we, then I talked to him later and he said, he has to unteach special relativity to all his grad st students. Do we hear this on the news? Do we hear this in universities? No. No one wants to say Gandhi was a bad person or Jesus Christ was a terrible person. They don't, they, they don't want to be that person to do it. And so, th they literally, he says to me, a physicist at Stanford Linear Accelerator, that they unteach special relativity. What's his name? Um, Dr. Kelsey, I think is his name. It's been a while. Um, I don't know how public he'll be about or if he's retired by now, but um, he was the only one who would speak to me on that. Everybody else, uh, it was actually during 2005 and the Stanford Linear Accelerator was getting literally hundreds of calls a week about Einstein, because it was his quote unquote hundredth anniversary of his miracle year of his three discoveries. Mm -hmm. And um actually one of um James Cameron's friends was tapped to direct the Einstein um documentary at that time by PBS. And and I asked this guy before he was in my little film, right? Were you in that? He goes, Yeah, I went. I said, What were you, what were you doing? Did they ask you about all this that I'm asking you about? And they go, No. What did you do in his film? Well, I went up and down a ladder 17 times until they got the take right. And so they were not interested in really talking about what Einstein did and, and couching it in today's terms, which a lot of times you do get. They were interested in that myth. They wanted that genius human beings want genius they want to mm. they want to think that there's some human brain that's because our world is full of so many gray areas and so many problems and nothing seems to go right we want these ideas that we have an einstein and we'll keep his brain in a jar just because we want this fantasy of genius genius doesn't exist genius is a a, a fantasy mm. we have people who are very good at stuff but the idea of genius is a fantasy and we want to keep, we want Einstein to continue. because He's kind of a think. savior character too, right? In yeah. an interesting way, like there's this interesting thing that happened, you know, like Nietzsche called it the death of God, but essentially we got so rational that we couldn't handle our superstitions anymore. And so right. to have a physical 
theory that no one understands anyways, it doesn't matter, who cares, but to have one that people will at least hold up in the air that opens up the door to those things that we had to turn away from due to our rationalism, like to see it come full circle, like people want that. Well, it's magic, right? You have two twins. One is traveling nearly at the speed of light. He comes back and everybody's old. You can travel through time. You can travel through, like there's all of these experiments. I think this is what you're saying. Like people want science to do something that it's not cut out to do, right? They want it to answer the basic questions that myth used to answer, right? Where, who are we? Where do we come from? Why is this place here? here in the first place and what's gonna happen after i die they're like if science can tell me that stuff i will bow down and shell out money and shut up and not only that but if science tells me that magic still exists in the world like i think right. that no one really acknowledges the depth to which special relativity was super spooky and super oh, weird yeah. and opened sure. the door to really wild interpretations of Absolutely. the universe whereas before you live in this really drab newtonian place that it just like it kind of du- it plods and, and along. not only does it do all that but it, it is effective at some gr- some scale resolution of the universe right mm. e equals mc square like it's it's heralded as this like great discovery and everything but it's basically the ancient principle of these viva it's even the same equation basically you just do it for a static it piece of material right what is these viva? viva was the the idea of energy before it was actually you know the greeks came up with the word energia but like the later on it was resurrected uh, as this idea this mv squared principle mm. Um, which we later turned into uh, our kin- our kinematic energy and stuff. But Einstein was sort of aimed at that in the first place. He knew that was the case. And people have known that this concept that material has energy stored in it for a long time. Um, it was just a matter of of working it back towards these solutions that needed to happen in the first place anyways. And so you're right. It did kick open the door for like all this mysticism and stuff. But it was yeah. grounded in an understanding of the physical universe that we kind of had already. And like quantum is another place of mysticism, right? Like, so there was a headline. I just, I just, I just, you know, really quickly Googled like Einstein was wrong. And the first article is from, uh, it's on space.com and it came out like a month ago, right? And it's basically the title is, was Einstein wrong? Sorry, it came out a year ago. I feel like I see these all the time. Yeah. Okay. The case against space time theory. But what they're trying to replace it with is they're replacing it with quantum theory and yeah. field theory, where they're basically, yeah. when you go to the bottom of quantum field theory, you get a set of vectors that change with time. And you ask, what is creating the measurement that the vector represents? And the baseline is, that's a stupid question. There's, it's- yeah, mathematics has become physical. And so much so when I was my dad and I were writing our book, and we were talking about simple idea that gravity is a push, right? This guy said, gave me my book back and said, I can't even get past gravity as a push. I said, well, what do you think gravity is? It's tensor equations, right? And he said, and I've got a degree in math, so I love math, math even, you know, but he said, I said, well, tensor equations aren't physical. He goes, yes, they are. So there you are. And, and, and energy, we know now, even mainstream is coming around to the fact that energy is a great concept. It's not a real thing. It's, it's, it's a concept we use very well. And the idea that there's work inside something is actually very specific. You know, this idea that you can just take mass and that it has all this energy, we can calculate it. That's kind of a little weird. What we really do know is we have mass and it can do so much work in this way, but there's still mass left over, you, you know, this whole idea. So energy is now, I've seen mainstream articles come out. The other thing about Einstein wrong, what they do talk about is that Einstein's relativity is wrong in the middle of, of the point singulars and black holes. And then, you know, the, that's what uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson says. So, yeah, I mean, you're you're touching on the quantum mechanics. The problem there is, is they don't know what's happening when they think they're shooting one particle at a slit and it looks like it's more. It's more. We just think it is one. And, and and with that, we then make all these these logical interpretations that we have to have a part one particle being in two places, which is an absurd idea. And from there we go on to, you know, history erasing, you know, the whole thing in quantum mechanics just goes. Can I wild. can I actually uh can I actually say Einstein hated that stuff? And actually Einstein wasn't 
a huge proponent of all this spooky stuff. Oh yeah, people no, took people took his image and ran away with it. And I feel kind of oh, yeah, bad yeah, for the guy, actually. right? He's like yeah. be, he's become a T-shirt essentially. But yeah. he he actually didn't buy into any of that stuff. I mean, he, and there's some fierce uh, argumentation between him and the quantum physicists of his day. Oh, and, yeah, um, absolutely. You know, both of them failed to interpret the the spooky experiments, like the double slit experiment. But sadly. Uh, the spookiest of them took the cake at the end of the day. I think that we live in a time where the thing that is going to really shift our understanding will have to be the engineers. Like, I really believe in this. I'm like, okay, if you have a theory that is better than special relativity or is better than whatever, better than quantum theory in terms of being able to help people think about how to build stuff... And then you can build yeah, a Can you build a more accurate uh, GPS system? Yeah, can you build a more accurate GPS system? Can you build an anti-gravity drive? Can you build a quantum computer? Can you build something on the basis of a different way of seeing the world? And that, I think, is going to be the next... That, that is what the cult needs. Because you have to... like. Okay, so if we assume that the reason that people liked Einstein and quantum is because it was magic... And we also have the... And it worked. And it worked. And that you also have that any piece of technology sufficiently advanced feels like magic, then what you have to do is you have to build a piece of technology that feels like magic to replace the magic that people have placed in science. <laughs> That's my proof yeah. of that. I like I really think that that's that's what needs to happen, but it's really hard, right? Because in order to build like an anti-gravity drive, god, how much money do you think you need? Well, what yeah, I, I agree with that and there's a part that I that I don't agree. I think you're uh -huh. right in some sense, but the other part is engineers have been working with things they have not understand for years. Mm -hmm. I mean, just absolutely of uh, uh, hundreds of years. We've been working with magnetism. We don't really know what that is, even though we have we do now have models outside of mainstream. We do have models for all this, but um, we don't know that. We don't know what electricity is. Electrons go at what a, f a couple feet per second, yet we know it's traveling near the speed of light. Um, we have people using um, lasers. Uh, light is a wave. If light's a wave through a medium, you can't have a laser. You can't shoot a, a wave through the ocean to, to China that that'll stay one foot wide. Um, you know, there's all kinds of things that we're doing. GPS, we're doing that. Uh, my my friend, uh, uh, colleague uh, Ron Hatch, had over 30 patents. He became wealthy with that. He um basically could calculate the the position of a tractor for John Deere within centimeters on the on the earth on the earth. They were doing all kinds of calculations. They they didn't use relativity anywhere. It never even came across their lips. What they were doing were doing real experiments by sending signals, trying to understand the, the mechanisms. And, and that's what's really happening. Uh, a photonics expert at, at our um, Natural Philosophy Alliance at the time, about 20 years ago, he, he spent his whole life working with light. Here's what he said. He stood up at our dissident conference. This is what he said. He says, this is what you know about light. Something called a photon, which we have no idea is, is emitted from somewhere, which we know, have no idea how that happens. It then travels through space, which again, we have no idea how that happens. It comes through, comes to our detector, it sets off our detector, we're not really sure how that happens either, and that's what we know about photonics, and I'm one of the world's experts. What happens is, I think also can shift, is when we get to the point where critical thinking will overtake fantasy, where people are just tired of it. They're going to say, you know, I'm hearing all this stuff, but nothing's coming out of it. What's, you know, they'll go, what is really light? Tell me what that is. What's mm. magnetism? Mm. What is, the, what are these things? So the engineers have been working with things they have no idea about what's going on. In fact, my well, they don't need a, they don't need a material basis for any of those things, right? You can make them, no. you can make a mathematical equation. Like, look, people developed bows and arrows long before they had aerodynamics equations to fine tune yeah. where the little flippers should go or whatever. Okay. So you are correct in 99.999% of cases, I totally 100% agree with you. 100% in 99.9 .9 of the cases. Yes, exactly. Okay, so <laughs> I'm not a mathematician. Um, I, I, I was, so my, my brother is like a hardcore engineer and we have been working on this like physics project where we're trying to come up with 
explanations for what all of these things are. And so this is material interpretations, material interpretations of the mathematics in order to be able to like explain what they actually are. What right? is light? What is magnetism? Yeah, we were, we got our book. We wrote about we our book is exactly about that. Okay, fantastic. Mm -hmm. So like we yeah. share we share that interest. And Alosha yeah, sure. Alosha made the same argument where he was like, "Yo, we have models and they work fine, and we can build stuff with them." And that's right. always stymied me until literally this last week where I sat down. And I was like, "Look, if you go back to the time before we had DNA." And instead of DNA, what you had was that you had the scientists come up with something that they were like, look, clearly there's, hereditary, or there's heredity. We have equations that really well describe the process of heredity. And what's inside of cells is the hereditary field. The genetic field. The genetic field. It's in the nucleus. It's in the nucleus. <laughs> it's inside the cell. We need to look no further because that is where it lives. We have a mathematical description of how it changes over time. End of story. I don't think that we get to gene therapies. I don't think that we get to molecular cloning. I don't think that we get to Definitely any, don't get CRISPR-Cas. We certainly don't get CRISPR-Cas. Like, I don't think that we ever get down to brass tacks of how this stuff happens or the tools that we've spent the last century building without a physical interpretation of what the hell that stuff is. Because mm. I don't think that the human brain is capable of thinking mathematically like purely mathematically like that. Like I've I think it leads us sideways too. I mean, there's my favorite example is uh, the the kinetic theory of gases, right? Mm. I mean, people used to think that heat was a flowing substance. You know, I love telling this mm. one to students. I mean, it just blows their mind. Like people. Not only did they think so, but the math worked perfectly, actually. Mm -hmm. The thermodynamic equations worked perfectly. So you can have like a brilliant mathematical understanding of reality. You can even implement it in technologies that are hyper-advanced, and you can be completely wrong about what's going on there. And Absolutely. I think that if you could figure it out, you have the opportunity to build stuff that's way beyond what you can imagine right now. There you now. go. Yeah, yeah. But my, my dad's an electrical engineer. And one of the things we did with our model, we basically say the physicality of light, gravity, magnetism, and electricity all can be described in one of four motions that are prevalent in all levels of the universe. So my dad was applying this, this uh, model of motion to electronic electronic components motion of like of like an ether or something or anything. Mo motion no 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 anything um any uh, basically a gravitic field are part of the the gravity field and can, can be any gravity you can have gravitic field caused by galaxies galaxies moving in random directions will cause a gravitic field um how how the, how, how because that's that's known from graviton uh work that's r squared that you can generate the so the little the, gravity particles do it what I'm saying is a gravid. Well, again, this is just what you know. Let me get. That's a whole nother discussion. But let's get back to what we have a physical model for the whole whole universe. Everything. Well, that's what I'm trying to, to understand. Yeah, yeah. But, well, let's, but let's do my dad. Light. My dad. Yeah, but let's let's just take it. What you're you were saying about physicality. My dad. I said, what dad? Won't you take the trans the trans um, transistor, the diode, the capacitor, and use our model of real physicality to that model to see if anything comes up? Mm. And two things came up. One was a prediction, which we have verified that no one uh, knew, and that is current. Current is supposedly the same around a circuit all the way around, no matter how many resistors and anything you put in it. Turns out that it isn't, but you got to get a, a, a volt machine that costs $3,000 to measure it. Uh, another one was the transitional states of things like a, a, a transistor. There was no, there's no explanation for that curve that exists. As you turn it on, the transition it goes through until it gets to a steady state. And my dad, being an electrical engineer, who only used empirical equations, meaning nothing to do with physicality, looked at this physical model, applied it, and was totally blown away about things that we could look at that we could say you can measure and can explain without it. Now, what you were saying about what you could do with it and more that you could do with it, absolutely. I mean, those are the kinds of ideas that, that you have. But giving physicality to things. What is the physicality that I still don't understand that about this model yet? What's, oh, uh, uh, what do you mean uh, by physical? There's, there's four in our model. We have four universal motions: gravitic motion. But motion has to start with a body, right? Like some some material yeah. actor has to be moving. It doesn't right? matter what okay. it is. So what there's is? How are they like? Bodies. How are two bodies in your conception? 
exerting charge upon one another, let's say. Or like how There's they no produce charge, electricity. Charge. Okay, so no charge. So what about gravity? They do exert gravity on each other? Again, this is this is something that will take would take a little time. That's okay. Basically, there's gravity is caused by random particles that are similar. Doesn't matter if they're galaxies, whether they're gravitons or whether they're what we think is another particle really much smaller, much faster than the speed of light at the atomic level doing the same thing. Anything that's a gravitic field, anything that I, causes ca causes uh, you know um, orbiting or bending because of orbits you know, like when we so like how does it how does a galaxy do it or like you can i don't care like well, what what you, objects uh, you all use. the galaxies in the universe that are moving if mm. they were if they turn out to be moving in random directions if there are larger structures than galaxies like giant huge ridiculous planet sized things which we are just galaxies are just these teeny little particles these galaxies if it, no matter what particles are moving in a random direction mathematically they re, they create a, what is it called the gravitic field and this but you but you just said it was physical though now you're saying it's mathematical yeah no no but like how are they physically called, how are they physically called the shadowing effect this is something that's been known for oh like a lesage type thing yes absolutely but a lesage is just simply happens can happen at any level because you know if you have so galaxies the, doing see. and there was a there I was i don't know what the lesage yeah, yeah yeah is. let's let's uh let's bring people <laughs> into that idea so the shadowing effect is like Basically, this idea that the different bodies are emitting this particles, these particles like a fire hose in every direction. And then when you actually put another object in front of it, you get a shadow. And because they're getting hit from all sides, they're pushed towards one another. So it's a push theory of gravity. I see, I see, I see, I see. Um, it's and 300 years old, the idea. But we say that's happening, actually. If you look at the equation, what the equation for gravity is the resulting motion of bodies in a gravitic field. It doesn't tell you what a gravitic field is right? That's what it is. If you look at the Coulomb's law equation for charges, and you look at the gravitic, the, the, the uh, force equation for gravity, it has been known for hundreds of uh, over 100 years that those equations look identical. But why is the why is, why is the attraction of charge so much stronger than the attraction of gravity if it's the same thing that's pushing? Them it's together? not the same thing. It's not They're the like same different thing. particles or something. There are different levels. That is the level of gravity that that galaxies will exert upon gigantic, humongous, uh, whatever structures would be out there. That is different from a gravity particle that keeps the Earth in orbit, which is different from a, a gravity particle, which is a different particle, which is smaller and faster, that keeps an electron in orbit around a nucleus. It's just any movement that is random particles that are similar if you have a bigger thing or amongst in that field they will exhibit gravitational movement uh, people people took that really seriously for a little while i think back in the 1700s and, oh, yeah, and they, they had so, they had some I, I don't know the details of it i haven't studied it enough um sadly but they, there was some issues with the drag coefficients there was like some thermodynamic crisis that happened that yeah, let everybody like, they they said know? that everything would heat up Oh yeah yeah, 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 that's right. But that's 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 their interpretation. Of course, they didn't have a model for it, so you can talk about it, but they didn't, you know, exhibit a model for it. But again, I'm not talking about that. Gravitic fields, what we're saying in our universal form motions that we have used to to give uh, magnetic fields are simply orbits. That's all particles that orbit. Um, light is what my dad came up with in 2015, which are light are waves of particles. You know how you have bomber waves of bombers? That is waves of bombers coming over. That is, you can't get frequency from one particle. Frequency means frequent, meaning it has to be more than one. So my dad's model of light is not a one particle like a photon, and it's not an ether being, it's, it's literally waves of particles moving together. Mm -hmm. So you can have lots of them to make them stronger. You can have the frequency like everything. So he, it was a solution to the wave particle duality that light are waves of particles. And it doesn't matter if we have waves of galaxies or waves of- How do they interfere like if they're waves of particles? Because they'll hit stuff and they'll reflect. It's it's a physical world. But like the like say like a like a diffraction situation where you're like yeah, reflecting have, shadows or you're reflecting yeah. bands of light into the dark. You, if you buy our book, we have diagrams on how that. The more, more I got to buy the book. 
No, no, no. I got to get no, another job. I'll send you one. I'll send you one. Um, the thing is about it's not that. What, what the more interesting one are two things. What is really white light in our model, and what is really um, dispersion, which is the the rainbow, which no one has explained, and we we couldn't explain that again. Physical model. It's literally physical model. What, what do you mean? No, no one's explained the rainbow. Uh, they can't explain why it happens. They can explain the equations of how it happens, but they can't give you an explanation why there's white light, what it is, and why it would ever come up with diff- a rainbow. And we we actually have I mean, isn't a- it just like a dispersion principle, right? It's like it's losing some yeah, momentum, it's, it's empir- blah blah blah. The angles. No, it's it's empirical equations without physicality. Huh. That- I, I always understood it that way. For whatever like reason. when it Maybe. enters the prism, it the, the yeah. different wavelengths of light force it to disperse at different angles. They just have different energies, phase. right? They have different momentum. And... Right, right. They have they have lots of explanations that are not physical, but they do have explanations. Um, am I, why why is it a particle? Mo- why did you end up sticking with a particle model? Well, because the way we say particles is that it's anything that's a mass. What we believe, like Borkert believes, is you can never have a partless part. You can't go down and find in an atom a part that that's, doesn't have a part itself. Subunits. Mm. Right, right. So we believe in an infinitely up and down universe. That's so par- particle believe. to you means like a body, basically. Yeah. But it's body. weird because like exactly. particle in, in mathematical physics, particle just means like a point where a value is changing, like in a coordinate system, which the, is the, be- the which best, is very the bizarre. The best explanation that I've heard of particle in mainstream is that you can shoot a beam of particles. That's how you can distinguish. And I, your, your, your best, I like your idea, your, your wording is much better than a particle. It's a body. It could be a very small body. It yeah, Newton used bodies small. too. I'm trying to resurrect that because I think that root, that root, I like yeah, that. I think I that like really that. distinguishes what's going on here. Bo- everybody knows what a body is. There's no doubt about it. And if right. you and if you even if you try to use the word object, like I've tried that before too. But like my advisor when I was in grad school was just like, oh no, we have abstract objects. Like an object can have like yeah, gazillions yeah. of dimensions and everything. And I'm like, damn it, like that's actually a good point. Like object belongs to mathematics, sort of too. And so I'm like, but body, like that's what Newton like used. That. You know, it works. Yeah, like you have humanities that you, like a body of work or a body of, yeah, of ideas, not in science, but no, not, not in science. science yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. But you know what I like about body? What I like about your idea there is that it incorporates it's made of it's it's a collection of stuff mm. right mm. Yeah, I mean, it's yeah, a yeah. body and and that's what this really is about borkert and many of us in modern mm. uh mm. what i call critical thinking scientists outside of mainstream we're all pretty much to, I, the idea that yeah you can't go down somewhere and find a part that's that's it because the universe is not going to have this magical part, part, particle that has some brain that's going to make it do and pr- create this world. So the yeah, idea it's hard to argue body, with. Yeah, have yeah, you have yeah. you read like Goodell Asher Bach? Yes, I have. Oh, so good, yeah. right? Oh. So yeah, good. It's kind of kind of hits at this point. <laughs> I read it back in the 1980s, but yeah, I just kind of stumbled on it when I was on, at, on over break. I was at the family member's house, and I had it on the shelf, and I read it as a kid, or like at, when I was in college or is something. Yeah, it's a great. Book. Is that your sister's? I house? think it's my sister's. Yeah, house, yeah. yeah. it's a great book. I love it. Is it your sister's or is it? No. So actually, like husband? many years ago, we were supposed to. We we had a book club, and the three of us were supposed to oh, read that's right, that's Bach, right. and I think that only Alyosha read it. But yeah, it's got a. It's got. <laughs> it's got this really good point that like. No, once you learn a little bit more about something, there's always more details that emerge, right? Absolutely. And and why wouldn't it be the case with material existence? Like, why wouldn't you be able to look a little closer and be like, oh, well, these bo- these little sub bodies of the atom, whatever fiber composes the atom, well, it's probably got articulation points because it's got to flex yep. and it's got to break and bend and like all do all these yep. things. And it's like, yep. it's Absolutely. hard to imagine an end to that. I, I agree. I'm I'm kind of more and more persuaded to those. those I mean, when you start ideas. to get down into some of these questions, like there's no end to them, number one. And then number two, you start to really kind of brush up against really philosophical questions, right? Because oh, then at some point it's like, well, why is there something rather than nothing? Right. I hate yeah, that question. This is, why, <laughs> this, is why, this is why we call our group natural, we call ourselves natural philosophers. Mm, because that's that. really what we we our group was first the natural philosophy alliance we're now the john chappelle natural philosophy group um society but natural philosophy what we are we believe because philosophy is very important to science i mean just like when you have this problem of every part there are no partless parts as as borkert says you can never find it you can never find where two bodies ever hit because you have to go okay my fingers are hitting but they're made of atoms but i my oh atoms are hitting no they're made of electrons and protons they're 
but those are made of, of of something as well and they're so, so you have this the, the, you have mass or or you know mass or matter which you can never really kind of find and the way i kind of look at it is we got to realize we are we got to look at more of our locality cuz we we'll, it's impossible for us to know everything down and everything up mm-hmm. so we end up trying in our be- in our best world here to go further down and further up but we got to kind of stay there because the moment you get into the philosophical you're never going to find anything and then at that point you're going to go what's this all about alfie right i mean it's just <laughs> it's really i agree with you 100% and that's one of the reasons when we have our conferences even we have a lot of people talk about the philosophy of science, you know, what the philosophy is. Um, your assumptions are really important. Mm. People, re- re- when you talk, even the words you use are so important. Even like, like I said, I'm going to steal your idea of particle being bodies. Yeah, bodies is a much better way for, because you can, what we have is the movement of gravitic bodies. And it doesn't matter. See, I, the funny thing is, like, when you were explaining that to me, I didn't understand what you were saying until a I, I gripped that, loaded. right? It, it is. Loaded. For me, it's just like, it's... It is it's, too loaded. It's just a vector that it, that's, has some changing value in time. And I'm, I was so thinking, like, book. something subatomic. Like, when you're saying yeah, particle right, and you're right. treating a, a galaxy as a particle. It, it you're, just, like, thinking of electrons or yeah. <laughs> little bowling balls. Or no, right, right. So, we're, I'm going to steal that yeah, lock, take it, stock, take and ballot, and I'm going to put it in our new book, which we, we called our first book. Book the particle model, by the way, but we we defined the particle as a body. Nice, nice. So now nice. I'm going to take the second one, which is no, it's not a particle yeah. model. It's the four universal motions, yeah. and those emotions are of body. Oh yeah, absolutely. We're writing on a book and too anyway. right now, so we're gonna we're gonna so overwhelm I'm, the world with the concept. We're gonna bring it back. Isaac Newton's gonna be cheering for I us in the grave. You complete credit for that because <laughs> I don't I don't believe in stealing without. Uh, you can have it, man. There, these I, ideas are free. Ideas are free. Ideas of course, bringing them bringing them to the people is a whole different matter if you it takes a special angle to be able to reach people i always yeah, like tell i always tell my kids this too i'm like and i see it, it's so tragic all the time in the fringe science community it's like it's not enough to have a good idea actually like i can just right. sit here all day throwing good ideas out but like to actually take one and like actually do the effort of building the relationships necessary and like collaborating with the experimentalists and like that is just a Herculean oh, task, yeah. you know. Newton himself, I watched a documentary about his life. He was he was terrible at marketing himself. Mm. He was he didn't want to publish anything. He worked night and day, didn't care about being married, doing anything, just working. And he had solved the gravitational equation being an R squared problem many years before it was even published. He didn't sit under the tree and come up with the gravitational well, equation. Well, Hook Hook uh, helped him out with that too. Right. He came along and said, Hey, we're trying to find hey. Uh, uh, Newton, you got any ideas on this gravitational attraction and some kind of empirical equation? We can't come up with anything. And he literally turned and goes, yeah, I've already solved that. It's R squared. He kind of turned his way and walked away and the go, what a man, wait, wait. And <laughs> we need he, a like, hero. <laughs> yeah. And so he goes back and he says, write it down and, and he had to go recreate it or find it whatever he f- sends it the hook and hook says we're going to publish this because he was connected into the world like you mm. guys were saying. he was connected people listen he was dynamic he could talk about it and that's what happened and then he published it and all of a sudden the recluse guy who didn't care about anything sort of like the mad scientist guy all of a sudden cared about it and actually his ego got too big but it mm. wasn't if it wasn't for hook coming in and and doing that we may never have heard of it. He could have died in obscurity and had that someone else come up with the same thing. Oh, that's really interesting. I'd, yeah, I'd like to read some of those correspondences. I'd like to read that original letter because I, I thought I heard that Hook was kind of pissed off about this later too and wanted some of the oh, credit yeah, back. Yeah. yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, there was that problem too because what happened is at after that happened, a lot of the ideas that Newton had been working on with friends in the earlier mm-hmm. years, he started to take ownership of stuff that mm-hmm. wasn't only his. Mm-hmm. And and, that and it's like how much of that is him and how much of that is people just needing one guy to pile on and like really make a like people make these gods out like it happened to Einstein it must have happened to some extent to, to Newton as well it like, did it did it did but I think it was both parts mm. everything points that Newton was not innocent in that side mm. just like Edison right Edison didn't invent a lot of the stuff he did he just perfected it and made it mainstream he was a great um, marketer. 
Yeah. And also a friend of mine who uh, studies Shakespeare, he uh, uses Google and all these word frequencies. And I've got a master's in linguistics and linguistics mm -hmm. uh, in linguistics. So I'm very interested in it. And he found that this guy named Th um, Thomas, Thomas North, um, all uh, an incredible amount of the bi biggest plays were based on Thomas North work. <clears throat> and, and he can. Oh, find this is the, the alternate Shakespeare guy. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And and so what was what's interesting is that well what what Shakespeare turned out I talked with this guy who really is looking at trying to look at facts not look at Shakespeare's a god, right? That's what people think. Mm. What Shakespeare really did when I really talked to experts who were not married and, and in love with Shakespeare made him into a god was Shakespeare was a okay actor, but what he saw is that he could take the sophisticated plays that were only uh, really happening in the elite circles and not to the masses, put it into, you know, that Shakespeare, William Shakespeare theater in the round mm. that was for the average person. And they threw tomatoes and they were not sophisticated. They didn't read. A lot of these people weren't. He took a lot of the works like Thomas North's works, had other people with him rework them, make them into more dramatic stuff, and then was the world's best producer of his time. Ah, it's like he the was, Elizabethan YouTube or something. That's so that's interesting. That's what he was. Yeah. He wasn't the guy who wrote all these things. and He was literally taking them. He did help in that, but he got other people to do it. He was the world's best producer of taking what was like only in the elite uh, houses to the masses and we turned him into and what happened was when those came out we turned his works which were him and a lot of other people and and based on thomas thomas norse work into this god just like einstein mm. just like um you know n even newton at his time google has all these old ancient documents all the way back to the fifth 14th and 15th century when you do searches of passages of word combinations linguistically in shakespeare's works and in thomas north's works they can they are only found in those two places I see, and I see. so and the shakespearean i'm in love with uh, the idea of shakespeare being that guy with who just like einstein sat in the corner in his patent office and came up with amazing things that shakespeare is writing the most amazing you know english works turns out that was what what really was happening what happened was he took stuff from other people redid it used a lot of the same stuff and what the mystery was all along was how did he know about how lawyers work when he never hung out with these people well he was borrowing these things profusely and then marketing them and man they went like crazy when you have somebody wanting to sleep with their mom and kill their dad and that kind of thing you know you know talk about marketing he was the marketer. And so he ends up being not that crazy genius who couldn't market, but with the opposite, not the genius, but who could market the mm. heck out of it. And now we give him credit for it. We're mm. now only learning with revisionary uh, eyes what really happened. I see. So, so Thomas North was like the aristocrat who was yes. behind these plays in the first place. Yes. I see, I see. Well, yeah. Who's yeah. the guy who's doing, who, who, who's been doing these linguistic analyses? Are these your own or? Uh, yeah, no, it's a friend of mine. Okay. It's um, um, Matthew. Um, in fact, one of the interesting thing is one of the really great writers of books in, in this area actually teamed up and followed his, um, what's his name? Um, anyways, um, if you just look up Thomas North and um Yeah, I've been we kind of been Wait, meaning to is this to... guy also into expanding Earth? Yes. Okay, okay, okay. We have talked to him before. Yes, no, he's have... an amazing guy. Uh, we we emailed him or something and he was like, I don't want to talk about McCarthy. I don't McCarthy. want to talk about one of the subjects. And... Yeah, so what it was is that we wanted him to come on the podcast when we were doing stuff about expanding Earth, and he was like, I'll only talk about Shakespeare. Mm -hmm. and right, because he was so Earth into that. He's right. great. In fact, his evidence he came up for expanding Earth was quite phenomenal. He came up with with species that were in the Pacific uh islands that could never flowers and 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 animals that could never go into the seawater because they die and they would be in places on on two continents thousands and thousands and thousands of miles apart and the only explanation was they were together and they go against completely against plate tectonics and the pangea mm -hmm. theory so that's how yeah, i maybe met we should him. talk to him
Dennis McCarthy, that's his mm-hmm. name. Dennis, Dennis McCarthy, McCarthy, that's right. Yeah, one of our patrons is like a huge librarian of all of he's he's knows everything about these two theories, both uh, tectonics and expansion tectonics and the Shakespeare thing. And we've been kind of we, yeah. we haven't figured out how to fit it into a conversation, but that might be a good one. Yeah, Dennis YouTube McCarthy, is- yeah. He he had actually published a book with a very well known author who was totally not on board with the idea that that Thomas wow. North was the true origin of these huh. Big, big, the biggest, biggest plays plays of Shakespeare. And at the end, he is now a convert and he doesn't know what to do because he finds himself in a dissident position where people are kind of looking at him weird. And in in it's again, that's that whole thing again, where we're talking about the emotional side. The moment you see something that is not mainstream, if you have enough people pushing against you, you get labeled as crackpot. And even though you have evidence on your side, I mean. I mean, statistical evidence that's overwhelming. You, the chances of these phrases being in, in the same place only in these two works are, are, are astronomical. I mean, I'm a mathematician and a linguist. It, 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 it's, it's, it's proof to me because it can't, where else would it come from? And so, uh, anyway. It really it's, says it's, something kind of cool, too, about like what it means to create a resounding piece of art, you know, that, that it really right. does have to go through all these different people, you know, and it's so fascinating, like when you look at the history of art and science, how, you know, everything is treated as if there's these heroes that pop out of nowhere, but there's these whole underbellies of, of just just brilliant minds churning yes, that go yes. in into each of these productions you know yes. it's like bob dylan didn't just come out of nowhere you know what i mean like each oh, yeah, each sure. one of these br- these sure. quote unquote brilliant minds and i'm sure that i mean they are brilliant but like they're of a, a world that has made that happen essentially at yes, the same so the time. same way happens in our world with the npa and the cmps the natural philosophers we hang out with my dad and i would never have gotten to the four universal mo- motions and be able to give a physicality to everything and have it have be so resounding if we didn't stand on the shoulders of people and be around these people for decades if we i didn't have borkert i wouldn't have been there if i didn't know yonel Denou's underwater experiments for magnetism i wouldn't have I, I couldn't come up with that part. But my dad wasn't involved with this. He would have never come up with I, what I consider to be the real uh, uh, solution to the wave particle duality. We are standing on the these people. It's a different set. And usually what happens when you look back, those people at the time weren't known during their time. Mm-hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. They weren't known. You, you go back and think everybody on earth knew who Newton was. Well, they did after a while because he came into the courts and people knew him. They knew he was a scientist. But if you ask the person on the street about his gravitational equation, they would have absolutely no idea what that was. I mean, you, Gravity, might, mate. you, you might be able to do that again today and find out <laughs> yeah, that people have no idea. I think idea. that's still going on. Yeah, that's sad. Oh, please, don't don't make me so cynical about the human race. <laughs> um, you know, I saw an article, don't, don't do it. Don't I saw an it. article the other day that um, Gen Zs that were showing up at work didn't know how to like download programs from the the internet or install them onto their computers and so they were having to be taught which i just thought oh. to be so funny but oh yeah it's like yeah go ahead. go ahead um i wanted to ask you what about these underwater magnet experiments oh they're not underwater magnets they're underwater they're model physical models for for um, magnetism and we we have taken that and distilled magnetism is simply orbiting particle uh, orbiting bodies see <laughs> orbiting bodies i will be i agree with great. that much at least for sure right. i'm on the same so, page about that so you know the new uh, i i think it also helps by the way if, if i might just interject this sure, if this uh, is sure. if this is useful to you in the future i always like sure. to start when i talk to some mathematical physicist by getting them to agree that physics is the dynamic is the study of the dynamics of bodies and once you start right. there, it's like, okay, now we're always going to keep cycling back to that. Necessary. Sorry, I didn't mean to just derail you. I want to hear no, about No, that's the okay. I can see you're weaseling into our next book because I'm going to write more about you. Because <laughs> oh, man, don't worry about it. We're, agree- we'll, we'll write I'm not book. only agreeing with you, I'm also seeing that you have other parts of wisdom that I would love to put in there. So <laughs> This is all we we'll do. To talk about. <laughs> but you're talking about magnetism. Um, Yonel Denou uh, came to us uh, with his underwater experiments, which were literally his his daughter's inflatable kiddie pool in his hmm. house 
And he came up with one of the most astounding things I've ever seen. And so what he did is he had two cylinders in the in his first experiments, which were cylinders of wood, just about, you know, like a cylinder, not mm. too big, not too tall. And he put uh, uh, plastic hoses on them that you would use for hose and put a motor at the top. And he sp- was able to spin those in water. Of course, the, the rough edges of wood spun the water Mm. when he took two of those and then put them close to each other and he spun them in the same direction okay spun them in the same direction um they would actually um repel because what happens to the water oh yeah yeah. water i love it the water that's a beautiful demo yeah would collect collect would collide when he did them in opposite directions they would attract and then he took it to another level where he took two cylinders, put them sideways in the water, big, hunky cylinders. Now he's in a bigger pool. He had to buy a bigger plastic <laughs> pool. So he's out in his backyard and he's making these things spin. Very hard mechanically to do. He literally has them spinning on a ch- on a pulley kind of system where they, they're literally spinning by uh, a thing in the middle where it's rotating and it's spinning. There's like a gerbil running in a cage over here. And <laughs> yeah. So steam he, he, puts engines those, and stuff. he puts those down in the water. And not only does he get the same, uh, the attraction and repulsion of magnets from that, he gets them da- is working exactly like dangling magnets that are bar magnets hanging next to each other. Mm-hmm. Identical behavior that's awesome so that's where in our model in the four universal motions we have gravitic fields from lesage we have the i call them the denu effect which are the magnetic fields which are simply rotating particles that's all it is if you bring two of them together they'll either attract bodies (laughs) bodies thank you thank you bodies Those, those bodies my dad came up with the third universal movement in 2015 which are bodies traveling in waves of what we call light Mm. it's not one particle it's not in an ether they're bodies of particles like bombers coming at you in waves and the last one was my addition which was electricity which is basically bodies traveling together in a straight line Mm. and so that's what we call electric gravitic luminic which is a word i made up for a luminous so that is waves of bodies and you have magnetic which is just circular is the moon going around the earth a magnetic bodies yes that's a magnetism if it's it's not being used very much but if you were to have lots of these things happen and so we collected lesage denu my father and myself we saw that both that Gravity travels travels at the speed of light. We've has that measured. Chinese have measured that, and during a, a full eclipse, we know that light travels obviously at the speed of light. We know that magnetism travels at the speed of light because we use magnets to ex- accelerate particles to the speed of light, and we know electricity travels close to the speed of light. If it, it, the, the other thing I came up in our model is if all these particles travel at the speed of light, they've got to be the same particle. Mm-hmm. So we have the same, I mean, body. So the same body that creates magnetism, the same body that creates light, the same body, the movement that creates electricity and the same movement that creates um, um, magnetism are all the same body. They all travel at the speed of light. And that's just at our level of the universe. And that's what our model is about. The the movement of the four universal physical, physical movements. Mm. We came up with two of them. Yonel came up and Lesage came up with the other ones. And we can apply this to the subatomic level. Mm. Mm. And we get the, that's why the equation for Coulomb's law looks exactly the same because it's the equation for, for the Coulomb's law of attracting charges within the nucleus are exactly the same form as the equation for grav- grav- gravity. So it's a gravitic field. It's just not the same gravity. It's a smaller particle. We know it has to go faster than the speed of light. If light is a particle and it is curving, we know that it curves when it hits, you know, it hits your pool, it curves. When it hits a prism, it, it, it curves, light curves. The only way something can curve in a physical world is something can move faster than it. What does that mean? We know there has to be something faster than light. Wait, hold on, hold on. Yeah, sorry, I lost me on that. Uh, I I think that I understand, which is basically they're saying that if it's curving, it's traveling a path that's longer than the direct path. And so if the speed at which the the entire path is traveled, then the thing that's traveling along the curved path that is inscribed along the straight path has to go faster than than the front itself. Is that what you're saying? 
No, no, no. It's it's it, it, uh, what what I'm saying is that in a gravitic field, when you have bodies in a gravitic field, no matter what level you're at, what you if for 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 the moon to go around the Earth, the gravitic the gravitic part the gravitic body that's hitting it, the very small body, which people would call a particle, being small in just a colloquial way, mm. when, for it to make the a moon to go around the earth or actually they go around each other for that to happen you have to, you that that body that's hitting the moon has to be faster than the moon itself so if you have an electron going around the neutron uh, at the speed of light the way only thing or or light that's going past an atom that's being guided to make it into a rainbow that has to be hit by something to make it move and the only way something going at the speed of light can move is something that hits it that's faster than the speed of light through like a conservation of momentum type of no it just means that for anything to to be affected in in a generic sense like a gravitic field it has to have that gravitic field has to be smaller and faster than whatever it's making move so if you have light moving which we do know light is bent not by gravity but is being bent in a, in a pool, in a prism, the only thing that can make it bend is another particle, because everything's physical. Another. I see body. what you're saying. You're like, if it's getting deflected by atoms, then the surface of the atoms needs to be moving faster than the light itself. Basically, no, but. the thing that's making the thing that goes around the light that goes around the atom for let's say let's let's make it let's bring it up and call the um, light is a is a body. Let's call it the uh, uh, comet, right? Let's call it a comet. And let's call the nucleus the sun. Okay? For the comet to go around the sun and to curve that gravitic field, something has to be hitting it with a force, making that happen, right? The mm. shadowing effect, right? The shadowing mm. effect. This is and the Lissage that, principle, yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Right, exactly. That's what gravitic fields are. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. for it to, to, to move, it can't be going at the same speed of the comet. It'll never catch up to the comet. So what I'm saying is, gravitic fields always have to, uh, I, always I, have to be I, faster. I, can you can you steal me in it? Well, okay. It's hard. It's hard to take in, guys. At all no, no, no. We're trying to take in. No, no, we got it. It's um, okay. So the way that I understand, sorry, I had a hair in my mouth. Um, the way that I understand it is, and I'm trying to. I I have a mental picture here, which is right. that the 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 sun and the comet are both being hit by these gravitic and I actually the comet is the photon right in this no no, no 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 we're just literally yeah, yeah, not yeah, analogizing yeah, yeah, yeah. let's yeah. just talk about oh, he was talking about, yeah, comet, talk about the that. comet is the photon the comet right, it doesn't matter in his model matter. photons yeah. are little bodies yeah, that are flying yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. okay so basically okay the comet is the photon but we're gonna and the the yeah but you the can the talk sun about would it be the atom that the photon the like, nucleus nucleus okay the nucleus okay so they're they're being inundated from from all sides by these these gravitic carriers, right? And so something that I don't understand is because when I think about that, I think about like hard bodies colliding, and so I'm yes, like, if something's being is. well, if mm. something's being hit, and there's a collision, then I would expect there to be like a bounce back, oh, right? Yeah, we, yeah, that there is. I mean, gra gravity affects the the shape of all uh, all bodies. And so it's hard. F it, it affects the shape, but I'm also thinking about like the 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 gravitic. I, I actually think that using particle for the things that are the carriers of the force makes sense, and using body as the things that are being affected because you have to have two different things, right? right you have I know to what have. You're saying, oh, right? you're like, refining your vocabulary. You, are you trying uh, to get in my book too? <laughs> I, so, Dad, they're trying to get into our book. Next thing, you know what's going to happen? They're going to take it, and because they're so popular and they're good communicators, they'll take credit for it, and we'll die in obscurity. Uh, we, I'm telling you, we're working on our own book. No, it's okay. We see things a bit differently than you. We it's do. Right, we, so. the, the thing is, is that we spend a lot of time thinking about what's happening on the atomic level and how to explain this stuff. And this is basically our bread and butter. Like when we're sitting alone, this is what we're trying to do. We're, we're trying to explain like how these models work. And then we, like, for example, like we spent a full day trying to figure out the three polarizer paradox. And so we're walking around. Materially, and, you know, yeah, with bodies. With <laughs> bodies. <laughs> Are there done, po you know, polarity, you're talking about it? No, or like, polarizer. you know, the three polar po polarizer paradox where you have, uh, you have two polarizers and they're 90 degrees to one another and then you put, and they're, they're black. Yeah. And then you put yeah. another one between them and there's light. 
Mm-hmm. Like we we were trying to work out how to explain why that's happening from a material well, perspective, yeah, sure, which we, sure. we we can get to. But my um, and what f- I'm saying just before you get past that, yeah. if you use our universal motions, all of them, and you you do like we did, you can figure out pro- you can find a solution for it if you use those four universal motions. Yeah, and that's what we have found. So so yeah, um, I mean, we our, our thought process back. is like we share a lot of things in common with you. I don't absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I mean, absolutely. I guess like I guess we like we imagine that the fibers, these bodies, are actually able to interlock, and there's actually pull and not just push. Um, the Lesage thing is definitely something you want to explore in, in greater detail, but usually we're, we're also imagining that there's not just push in the universe, but there is actually pull as you well. You can't have a pull. You can't have a pull though. You can with fibers. Yeah. No, you can't. No, because even a pull on a fiber is actually a push. Wait, but no, you can, okay. if I can take my okay. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. One thing at a time, one thing at a time. Let's talk about this and let's, let's figure out the comet thing and then we can get yeah, down yeah, into yeah, the differences yeah. between theories. Okay. So oh, we don't have to do that. We don't with, have to do that. I mean, if we want to. The comet thing is I'm like, I'm trying to understand. So if everything is being hit by these gravitic particles and the gravitic right. particles are bouncing off of the things, then yeah. wouldn't you expect to see some kind of anomaly where it's like, because the gravitic particle is coming in from all directions that you wouldn't ever get a full shadow because like imagine of you course. Ha- no no absolutely You're okay right. so right. if you if you if you imagine the sun and then you imagine the gravitic particles hitting it from all directions and you have some it doesn't um, it, yeah a much smaller body that is near it it'll go through it no but things will go through gravitic, oh, they go through that they're, they're not yeah, they're they not hard collisions they can, no 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 there's three things that can happen okay you can do you can orbit that is you can orbit around something and it's kind of uh, uh, momentum wise change it a little bit you can hit it in a real collision or you can actually be captured and that's one of the reasons we say that you know expansion of particles through a gravitic field is a natural thing not only natural that it spews them out but it's also a natural thing so but what i was saying is for anything to be in a gravitic field and do and to be influenced by collision in the end let's just talk about collisions because they're different like you said you can go through Mm. We talk about that in our book, actually, those three things. It can go through orbit or curve or actually hit. Let's just talk about the hitting. For it to hit, it's going to have to be going faster than whatever that is. So if if the particle is no longer a comet, it's light, whatever's hitting it is smaller than light and faster than light, which means by ergo, with our model that it's a gravitic field, we do know because we think that the giveaway of of the uh, Coulomb's law of that is what keeps an, uh, uh, electrons going around uh, neutron is, is the equation. The empirical equation looks identical to a gravitic field, which is the gravity equation. The reason is there's a smaller, faster particle. It's another graviton, but graviton level two that's going faster than lead. Now, what the implications are, if we know that exists, then we, if we can control it and we can do limitic waves with gravity two, we have calculated we could transmit uh, signals to Mars in a fourth of a second. Now, that's a technology thing that you could use, for instance. But what I'm only, only saying is that a gravitic field of bodies, for something to be affected by, it has to be smaller than that. So if light if light we know is, is real, it's a real physical thing. For it to be bent, something has to be hitting it, and that has something has to be going faster than the speed of light. So the idea... It, is, it is, I just looked to, like on Wikipedia, and one of the standard criticisms of Lesage's theory is that it breaks special relativity, which is kind of fascinating. Well, so, and, and I'm finally, I'm understanding, <laughs> I think, funny. what you're trying to That's say, funny. is that, like, because, it's so, so since it has to be being inundated from all sides by this gravitic particle, the ones that are coming along in the same direction of motion have to be yes. going faster than the motion yes. in that direction. Wow, you're really good. I mean, it's just like I want to understand. No, you're right. Very, like you're, you, you and I are identical because. I think visually, I am actually an articles artist. I can sit down and draw your portrait pencil. Your pencil. your art is beautiful, by the way. You're oh, just like oh, it's so it's it's just you you have you have the touch. It's really nice. Yeah, it was one of those things I decided I didn't want to become a commercial artist because then you have to be known for one thing, mm. and then they want you to paint the same thing for the rest of your life. And I said, I'm mm. not going to do that. So I'd rather become famous for my other stuff, and then they collect me later. I don't know. <laughs> Yeah. But anyways, but anyways, you got the idea, right? You got yeah, the idea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I finally. So, but so, does that mean that they're all traveling faster than the speed of light, or only, or there's like a well, differential? It's an average. If it's you look at Borkert, uh, yeah. If you look at Borkert's um, infinite universe, 
one of the things we know is no two things are ever identical. No two electrons, mm. no two anythings are identical. So the speed of light is an average in that, in fact, what we think is going on is what we call this G1 particle or body, which we, which we think is responsible for light, gravity, you know, electricity, and the electron, the whole thing, all of the things, magnetism as well. That when it's, it, it goes faster, if you go, it, it speeds up. In fact, we have evidence of that in electronic circuits that the part, the body, which we call an el electron, actually speeds up and slows down. And that, of course, violates the idea that it would travel always at the speed of light. So the speed of the gravitic field for what we call Coulomb's law, which is this very strong force, which is way stronger than gra gravity. The gravitic field at our level is way weaker than the gravitic field there because they're going faster and moving, you know, much faster mm. is, is um, something that uh, is the reason why magnetism is so great because magnetism ends up being because of really its attraction comes from the gravitic two field, which overwhelms gravitic one. That's why you can put a powerful magnet and it just, it's gravity, our gravity here at this level does, this seems not to be, mm. but again, that's, uh, that's for the, um, but you were wanting to talk about something else uh, after that. I don't remember. What it was, it was push versus pull. Oh or yeah. So like, well, so lay, what, what, lay that what, what, out. What, what, Okay. Well, so you're you very a, certain about the fact that there can oh, yeah, only absolutely. be push. Absolutely. So walk so you, us through that. Shiloh has opinions. Here, here, let me. Nah, get, I don't let know, let me, know if I really. I don't know. That's okay. That's okay. Let me tell. Ones, but oh, let me have, tell you where I think that yeah. comes from linguistically. Yeah. The reason pull exists isn't because of physics. It's because of it's a necessity in our world around us to describe to other people that something is coming toward us. So when I pull a coffee cup using a, my hand i'm pushing it okay, okay, take your exactly. cup take your cup take your coffee cup and and pull it towards you you're i see i see behind. i see i see yeah you're pushing it from behind so what i'm saying is linguistically because my, my job for and during the day is to think about what words mean mm -hmm. because i i talk about that with computers that's my real job i think all day long what words mean and what we have in our head to make those words realistic the reason pull and attraction exists is because it's a point of view that's important to us in our daily mm. lives i pull someone toward me okay i push them away it's a direction to and from me it's not a physicality of what's happening something could be pushed towards you i guess no, but it's put. Yeah, that's push. push. Yeah, I, I would look at it a little differently. Like I, I think of pull as being a, a, a some analog of friction, essentially that that bodies can become enmeshed with one another. Particularly fibrous bodies can become enmeshed. And like you, Velcro. Like Velcro. But, that's still, but it's still being pushed. It, it is, being but pushed. It, it is, but it's 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 an easier convention to understand it that you have two opposing ideas here. One which is being acted outward and one which is being induced inward through a physical mechanism, which is, of course, yes, as you say, like the loop is exerting push from its opposite side to you. But I don't think that makes it like a worthless concept because, I mean, the way that I envision... No, no, it's not a worthless concept, yeah, no. I mean, the, 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 the Lesage theory of gravity is, is entirely a push-based model, despite the fact that it's coming towards me. I understand what you mean by push there. I'm just trying to think of other but cases physics, where it's like... But in in well, physics, I'm saying there are no pulls in the physical world. If I have a coil useful, of rope, hold on, useful. hold on. If I have a coil yes. of rope on the ground, right, and I like a like a climbing rope, right? Like at some point, you have a puddle of it on the ground, and you're having to, I I, I pull it up because what I do is I grab it, and then I pull. What's the push there? The like because there's there's the friction. friction. The, the friction you have to have little places on the rope that are little cliffs to which you are pushing it up. Oh God, I mean that's a really interesting. I like I like I like it. I like it. I'm not I'm not gonna lie. I think that's actually it's a really interesting linguistic thought experiment. And in terms of really digging down to the definitions, like because in, uh, in physics, if you I'm in physics, yeah, like if you if you really really start to like delve down to the atomic level, and what you have to do is you have to be able to like wrap around the back of something or wrap underneath something in order to be able to exert the force. Right. Well, that's why Newton literally combined push and pull into one term that he called force, basically. Oh, that's 
That's right? so That's what a force, force is. So oh, you can man, have a tensile really cool. force, which is the one that we're talking about. I mean, I'm like, I could be more specific, but like the way that I imagine gravity is differently than the way that you imagine gravity, right? And that's what I'm trying to get at when I use the word pull, right? I actually imagine that the, the atoms have an elongated structure that, in which they're actually attached to one another. We can send you a video on this. We've made one. But, but see, but even then, what you have at the subatomic level. You're, you're right. You're is, absolutely is, right. You're absolutely yeah, 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 right. You're, you're right, absolutely you're right. right. Yeah. And I think that that's really interesting because it is the macro scale versus the micro scale. And it's it's like a question of which scale do you focus on? Because when you're you're exactly right that when I pull the cup towards me, I'd never even thought about the fact that I was really actually pushing it towards me. That was my dad's example he uses when he explains there's only pushes. Yeah. And I just like I like the things that that f- that simplify. Mm because if you if you can come down and be like look there's only this way of looking at things and then you can build other stuff on top of that but you yes. approach a fundamental right then and that's why if you, yeah if you look at for instance our model with the four four universal movements of bodies right the gravitic bo- force is the is the fundamental force without that you can't have orbiting Without that, you can't create atoms. Atoms, it turns another person you could talk with, Jeff Yi. I love his. He's oh, a, we know Jeff. A, yeah, he he makes a model. In fact, he came up with an explanation where I told I told him I said you don't know what you did, but you have now introduced uh, magnetic movement in the G two level. That is the level that is responsible for keeping and moving light and keeping elect- the ele- what we call the electron in orbit. There, that is a gravitic field. But the reason the atoms have the the those SPDF orbitals is because they're the gravitic the G two particles at that lower faster level are setting up G two magnetism, which I never thought of, which makes the elect the electron around atoms spin and keep in orbits in a certain way. Mm, and that, mm. and that's, that's how you get polarity yeah, in well, atoms because I really like how those guys are always thinking in terms of structure. Uh, like, yes, uh, yes. so like it's, what is it? Ye and Celia and Terrence Howard are kind of like hang yeah. out in a click together. And they, they got these cool structures that they come I up with that, that stabilize the uh, different parts of the atom. I think it's, I think it's intriguing for sure. And what I think is most interesting is that there is a field of people who are all recognizing that quantum and conventional interpretations don't make sense. And so there feels like there's this, it's just a time of great growth and exploration. The revolution is is coming. Yeah. It just, (laughs) it's like, it it feels so much more alive, right? Because you, you, you walk into a room full of people that are like, we've figured everything out and now we're going to be just like, we're theorizing and we're doing dark matter or we're doing like whatever it is that, that the Academy is like trying to incrementally, right. Is like trying to, in, exist, just yeah. bending time yeah like bending time and you just kind of you're like man i've been reading about this stuff in pop sci books for the last 30 years oh yeah yeah 40 years yeah. maybe i mean like i'm not we i have a good grasp on what time is people just just don't look to see the people who've looked at it you know time is basically just there because of movement we have right. to, uh, we, we have to we have time is in fact borker just says it time is movement in fact Time is a concept. You can't go out and show it. What it is to mm. us is there's something that is moving, and that's what we have come up to us for us to come up with the ability to understand that movement. Mm. And to say that that's a thing, I mean, space is it, the reason we have the word space in any almost every language on planet Earth from humans is we have to describe, at least in our perception, of some something that some place in the world, the universe that place. doesn't have any. <laughs> A place. Place. And so, and there's three dimensions to it. That's it. Yeah. Just because, you know, and that's, those are the kinds of things. And then we take time, which is that, and put them together, call it space time and bend it. It's nuts. It's just... (laughs) And I think you're right. So yeah, I've started using the word. Pl- I've started using the word place time. I like the word place time instead. Sh- Shiloh's uh, clearly it's- found his audience because he told us to, like we're on a walk, and he's oh like, "I've figured God. it out. I figured we were it out." We an art museum actually, we and were, and yeah. one of the artists discovered. She was just talking about all of my paintings are motivated by a sense of place and time, and I was like, "Place time. That's it. That's what they mean." <laughs> and because it's harder for a layperson yeah, to take like that, that seriously, like bending place. Like, what the hell does that right. even mean, really? Like. Right. 
Yeah. So it's funny because we talk about it so much that he told it to me, and I was just like in my in my <laughs> usual. <laughs> now was like, I, I don't know. It's, that's kind of dumb. I love it. I love it. I wasn't like. Take it, it. Take it. Yeah, I w- I didn't say <laughs> okay, that it was got, dumb. I, I was dumb. like, <laughs> you got bodies, you got place time. Bodies, and I got place time. Yeah, but that's, yeah. that's a good one. Man, it, it takes a community, man. Honestly, I believe that, and I don't believe oh, in yeah. the owner. I don't believe in the ownership of ideas. I think if you want to take anything, you know, just it's more important that we as as civilization build on, move forward, Absolutely. and actually come to understand Absolutely. these things. And so. Yeah, man. Absolutely. Um, and it, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I really, I do want to check out your book, man. If you, if your offer stands and you want to send us a copy, I would oh, yeah, definitely I love to check it out. Do that. I'll send it out to you, signed and everything. And, uh, we are, we are, we didn't understand our own model in our book after five or six years, and it was only like when my dad and I travel together in the car. We come up with the best ideas because he and I can talk all about this, and 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 people think we're absolutely out of our minds. <laughs> we're we're in heaven. And I came to my dad and I, I said, Dad, we we didn't understand anything what we found. We found the four universal motions of bodies, and that can be applied to everywhere in the universe. And we can just hack the universe with that. It's not the particle model. It's these motions that mm. we have, and 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 what we were doing in our first book was using those motions to hack the universe, just like you guys are trying to figure out how to do polarization and this or the polarized whatever you call that, right? Mm. We were doing the same, and we came up with it took us three years, but we came up finally came up with white light. We solved it. We solved white light in a mechanical form, but you know we didn't do that. None of this would have happened if I didn't meet Karazani. None of this merit would have happened if I didn't go to that group of people and listen to these people talking this way, true tr- critical thinkers who were not afraid to criticize anything and everything. Not to, there was no sacred cows. It, I, I met Borkert. He planted stuff. I saw Yonel Denou, who blew my mind. Borkert blew my mind. Yonel Denou blew my mind. My father blew my mind. Those three ended up. I ended up putting together this this whole four universal motions. None of them did. Why did I do that? Because I saw it, but I didn't do it alone. You can't, you can't. In, in our book, we talk about everyone who we stand on the shoulders. And I believe truly that's why we're giving lifetime achievement awards to these people, because in our time, we're not recognized. And I believe a hundred years from now, what you guys are doing, what we're doing, what my friends are doing, that's what people are going to look back and say. And they're going to think at our time, everybody knew what was going on. Oh, they're on the internet talking to <laughs> 4,000 people. Right. whoop de doo right, right? right? I mean, but I mean, it is. That's it's, why I think it's important not to get too hung up on the fame thing. Like not to get too hung up on like who cares about your name and everything. Because like yeah. it really just doesn't freaking matter. Like, it you know, you're going to live and die. You're not going to care anyways. Like who really cares yeah. if anybody knows your name? I mean, ultimately what's important is that this whole human project thing gets better in the future and the only way it's going to happen is by understanding nature better and i think that bitterness is the worst possible fate like i think Mm. that bitterness is so caustic to the soul that it is but it's hard it's understandable it's totally understandable but like and 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 the thing is is that like because it's so understandable it's an easy thing to fall into and i really really have to seek to approach science and in inquiry from a perspective of this is such a deeply fun thing to do it is it is fun and if no if i if i find a room full of 10 people that love to talk about it and we just spend you don't want to come to our conference you don't want to come to our conferences because that's all we have i mean just people they just you just sit there and and unfortunately because of covid we've been doing them virtual uh-huh. but and it's and it's expensive to travel but when we we would be able to for 5 days just find people to talk like this and who not only that you didn't have to be in that area you you know i may not be an expansionist but when i talk to someone they have that critical thinking like you guys i can listen to almost anything and if it's got you know some logic to it and it's got reality i'm going to listen Mm-hmm. And to have those kinds of people and to talk, that's just. You are, know, you gonna, are you going to bring it back on uh, in person at some points? Or do oh, you guys I'd have plans? Yeah. I'd love to. I'd love to. But I'd, the... like to, I'd like to bring you guys on to our two hour talks maybe a couple times. Heck yeah. Because I, I would love to just have people be exposed to. I think you guys are a little different because I'm, I'm exposed to the real Uber nerds. I mean, people <laughs> who can. 
I mean, they can multiply four numbers together longhand in their head. <laughs> I mean, I don't have a lot of people who can stand above it like myself and you guys who can kind of look at it at a higher level and kind of talk to people. And that's why I guess I've, I've naturally become the leader of the group because I can talk to people and not get into the emotional quibbles and, oh, I'm going to argue to death that this one thing, it's a pull, it's not a push. Mm. And you, you, know, <laughs> you can't fall out of that. I'm going so down with nice. the ship. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So I, I'd love to have you guys on. Um, yeah, that'd be really, really fun. Time. It's and, only two hours. so. And, and we would love to have some of those Uber nerds because we're always talking <laughs> yes. about the fact that oh, like, you I've need, got a ton. <laughs> you need the mathematics. Like we've talked to so many people across so many disciplines and they're like the only you've gotta thing. Talk, you've got to talk to um, um, Nick Percival. Okay. He is so darn interesting, this guy, and he's from Harvard, and he's a well-rounded person who can talk okay. to anybody. He's a, Nick Percival, just, oh my gosh, he'll blow your mind. He's okay. amazing. Right. He knows about time and stuff. And he and I talk for many, you know, I'm giving him a Lifetime Achievement Award. That's one of them. I can, I'll give you a bunch of people. Don't worry. Okay. Do that. All right. That's excellent. David, oh, this man, has been yeah. fantastic. It's been really it's, fun. These conversations sometimes they go off the rails, and I get off the phone, and I I can I can be tired afterwards. And then there's other oh, times yeah. where they're so good that I walk away feeling like the universe is a better place for having had the conversation. And this oh, I do. I'm I'm stealing all kinds of ideas from you guys <laughs> from my book, no, my dad's nice awesome. book. So, but no, I I agree, and um, I think no, not only that, we need to try. I'll say this honestly: um, there's not a lot of you and I, you you two and I out there because there's a lot of people out there that have the ability to do these things and talk. Like you, we know in history, they're not all ability to get out there and speak at a higher level to kind of bring it together, to be able to talk like we have without, you know, you can talk, I can talk nitty gritty, but, you know, go back and say, what does this all mean? Actually be able to deal with some of these people sometimes, man. I mean, we've had conferences where I, I literally, people would argue after a talk. Next thing I know, cause I'm the president, I'm in that, I'm in the conference room. We were at the university of, um, of, um, it was in, um, um, Vancouver university in Canada. And I hear Dave got to come out here. Next thing I know, someone threw hot coffee at another person. Oh my God. Him. No. And, 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 and they were like, I'm oh never coming back God. this person. And so I had to diffuse it. And I literally went to each person and said, look, I get this mad at the mainstream all the time. I'd love to go to Neil deGrasse Tyson. And when he holds up his phone saying, if it wasn't for relativity, GPS wouldn't work. I'd like to throw coffee in here. <laughs> but the thing is, is that you have, you're passionate. You have an amazing ideas. The reason people are passionate too, they're here. Sometimes we get into those lock states and, 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 the, and I'm a person who can do that. It's not everybody. And that's a different type of vision. So I do want to say to you, I think we all, also, who are the communicators need to get together and also join forces because I think we as a group of those people who have that ability, which are you guys have, and congratulations, take my hat off. I wish I had three of you in my organization, so I'm not all alone. But that I think also is an important thing we need to do because mm. if we band together and we get to talk, we talk at a little bit different level. We bring it back to something that's more on the ground. You guys do that. I've seen you time and time in our conversation and I do that. These are really important because if we have a panel of us even sitting together in a physical location at one time and we talk about these kinds of things, film them, people are going to see things and they're going to see a, a community and leaders because the other guys are going to throw coffee at each other because they're passionate. <laughs> but, you know, they still are there. And they, th when I go up with them, they, feel, they know that people like yourselves are the same way. I, I don't see you guys bringing someone on that maybe you disagree with, but attack. I have people that talk about stuff that I have zero agreement with them. But I, pour, I support them because they're critical thinkers. Mm -hmm. They have a different idea. And and we have to allow that, even if we ourselves don't agree with it. And That's I always right. try to get something. That kind of leadership is needed in this community as well. So I'm saying... And, I, and I wish people could realize that even like their most bitter uh, intellectual rival 
Like right. they have something to learn from that person. They have, they have some common. good ideas in there. They have common ideas. There and there's a lot of common ideas. Right. And there's things you can pull out of that too. Even if Absolutely. you don't subs- you don't have to subscribe to their theory, but like open your mind up. Like just consider what they're saying and look at the logic of it and see what you can yes. bring into your own world. Um yes. so and I hope what we're doing is useful and you know, no, I, 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 we Where often tr- we trouble ourselves with if there's a if there's an apocalypse, we're not going to have a lot of uh, viable skills to bring to this. None. The, uh, none. <laughs> the none. <We laughs> the survivalist no world, but, <laughs> but as long as uh, as long as there's civilization and there's science, um, I hope that we can help out. So yeah, no, you guys are doing a great a great service. I mean, Thanks, to man. Have you me too. On, to have me on, that's not easy. Most people uh, won't talk about this stuff at all, <laughs> and you know, and I think that's sad. So congratulations, and uh, definitely have you guys on. Let's do it. Uh, yeah. Let's do it. Let's do that. Okay. Yeah, man. Yeah. Fantastic. Have a great rest of your day, and uh, I hope all we can right. link up and again soon. I'll send you my, send you a copy of our book. Okay, yeah, guys. Thanks, man. Thank you. Okay, and congratulations. You guys are really bright minds. Uh, thanks, man. Very, very. And if we do have an in person, I'll definitely I will definitely invite you guys to come and and talk. Let's okay? do it. Let's That'd do it. Absolutely. Right. Okay, okay we'll guys. See you, see you later. Take Bye, care. David. Bye. Bye-bye.